but you know somebody on twitter had a very f- great comment about you said that you're more of a proofreader for history it's more you're more than an egyptologist <laughs> well okay i i sometimes call depending on my audience I sometimes call myself a rogue Egyptologist. A rogue Egyptologist. And if you folks who aren't seeing online, if you're listening to this only on uh, iTunes, John has an office that is exactly what I would hope and pray his office would look like, just filled with documents and information and books. And it's crazy, man. Look at all that information behind you. <laughs> you look like a mad Don't scientist. You look like Alex Jones's car. Yeah, you're, you're a, a mad scientist, sir. Um, well, for, people have called me that, yes. I uh, first was turned on to your work by the NBC special on the Sphinx that was uh, hosted by Charlton Heston, right. and, uh, which was a very controversial uh, thing uh, that, that NBC aired, right? And it was mm. a, a special on the, the mysteries of the dating of the Sphinx. That's and right. became absolutely fascinated by the compelling evidence that you and Dr. Shock presented to all these traditional Egyptologists that the rain erosion on the Sphinx enclosure had to have come from literally seven or eight thousand years earlier than they were predated than they were dating the Sphinx. Uh, yeah, probably more than that, Joe. And we'll get into that if we want to discuss it further, but. That's the that was the most conservative date that Shock, as a you know as a bona fide uh, PhD geologist, he sort of constrained to take the most conservative view. But he even had doubts about it when he was saying it. But now he's he's loosening up by a lot, and is basically on on the same card as me. In other words, holding open the possibility that it may be as old as actually is 36,000 BC or even older and the reason for that is not fantasizing or anything of the sort it's that the Egyptians themselves in several and one in a in a, a tablet a, a stela called the Palermo stone because not because it has anything to do with Palermo but because that's where it is and another papyrus very fragmentary called the Turin papyrus where the Egyptians themselves the ancient Egyptians talk about long periods prior to the beginning of what we call dynastic Egypt, what they just called Egypt, that begins around 3500 BC, where Egypt is ruled for thousands and thousands and thousands of years by the Necheru, which means the gods themselves, which actually means, I take to mean enlightened or divinely enlightened human beings. And then another long, long period where Egypt is ruled by the Shemsuhor, which means the companions or the followers of Horus. And the regnal, the, the names of these kings are given, and the regnal dates of these kings are given, and though both the stone is damaged and the papyrus is somewhat fragmentary, if you compute the years, you end up with something like 36,000 BC, which in fact is not, is not a casually chosen date because the Sphinx itself, as you know, um, it has, and actually, as we go along, somewhere along the line, we'll have to talk about this, because I can send you all kinds of interesting um, pics, you know, illustrations, where maybe you can, on your end, um, intersperse them, intercalate them into the actual video uh, vodcast, I guess you call it, so that viewers can see what we're talking about as we're talking about it. Anyway... If we can do that, great. If we can't, we'll yeah, no, we can. We can definitely do that. But for the okay. audio only people, this is a fascinating conversation. Uh, either way, w- with or without pictures, how did you get on this path? How did uh, you? We just finish, I'll tell you in two seconds. But first, let me just say the the reason why the thirty six thousand date is is not as outrageous as it might sound is a because the Egyptians themselves are talking about that sort of date, and also because the Sphinx with its lion's body and human head, screams out as an astronomical, astrological marker. And if it, it's meant to commemorate the age of Leo. The last age of Leo is where the Sphinx, and the relationship is that the Sphinx is sighted so that it looks due east. And so the last time the Sphinx looked at its own image in the sky before the sun rose, that's how they talk about the processional ages. If you want to get into that, we can. Um, it's, it's, it's not complex astronomy, but it's astronomy. Anyway, the last time the Sphinx looked at its own image in the sky at sunrise on the spring equinox 
would have been about 10,000, 10,500 BC. But there are good reasons why 10,500 BC is not satisfactory. And the, 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 the age before that, the age of Leo before that, is, is another 26,000 years earlier. Because the cycle, the so-called precession of the equinox cycle, takes 20, roughly 20, 26,000 years. So 36,000 years would have been another time when the Sphinx looked at its, at its own image in the sky at the, at, the, uh, at the spring equinox. So there are reasons, I mean, as I said, it's, it's not just fantasizing, it's, it's, it's backed up, it's conjectural, of course, we can't prove it as, at the moment, but there are good reasons why it could be as old as that. There, but conventional wisdom is that human civilization in it, the you know, in the the, the form of cities and such that that didn't exist before ten thousand years ago, right? Well, it was conventional wisdom until very recently. It's one of the battles that we've had that we've had to fight. But you see, <laughs> it's a long story. Shank, Shank and I are writing a book. I'll tell you more about this as we go along, I'm telling the story of this whole Sphinx thing, because. We presented, this is a geological argument. Um, it's about the water weathering to the Sphinx, or the weathering to the Sphinx. With Chuck as a geologist and a specialist in these things, um, it took a lot, a lot to get him on board, mind you. This is a long, it's a big, long, funny story, which I won't get into necessarily right now here, though, since we have an open-ended, um, we have an open-ended show and I have plenty of vodka in the freezer. We <laughs> might go on for quite a while. But anyway, the... <laughs> <laughs> the, <clears throat> the, the, the point is that it's a geological argument, and when I got Shock on board, he, it took him a while before he had acknowledged that it had to be correct. I mean, he was putting, see, for me, to be a heretic is easy. I don't give a damn. I mean, I don't like these people, and I don't respect either their intelligence or their integrity, so, and I have nothing to lose. You know, Schock is a tenured associate professor of geology at, at Boston University, so he, has, he puts his neck on the line, that means something. Eventually, it took a bit of doing, but he did it. And then we presented this evidence first at the, at the, the you might call it the Super Bowl of geology. It's called the, um, it's the, the, the annual meeting of the Geological Society of America. This was in 1991. And we were the stars of the show. I mean, they recognized the Geological Society, recognized that this was a dynamite uh, presentation. And so all the press was there, the science press of the world and, and so on. And it was that that actually allowed us to get this thing past the secretaries at NBC and, and, and put it out you know, in, in, pr in prime time. Um, what do they call it? Sweeps Week. And it won me an Emmy and it was nominated for best documentary of that year, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was that that brought it to the, that forced the quackademics to pay attention to it. And, and the battle has been going on ever since. And actually, funny story, because I can say it here, but normally I can't on a, on a, on a, on a normal, respectable show. <laughs> um, and, and you'll appreciate it. I've watched a couple of your shows, so I know I can get away with it here. <laughs> when, and we, when we gave this, presentation initially in 1991, the, the geologists were unanimously in favor of it. They came to our presentation and they walked past our display and they said, yeah, you know, I mean, how could anybody have missed this? Well, that's another bit of the story. But, so, but the Egyptologists and the archaeologists were absolutely incensed by the whole thing. And they were calling us all kinds of names. And there was one woman at who I will go nameless here, but she'll be coming up in the book somewhere soon, who is a, an, an Egyptologist at Boston University where Shock teaches. And, oh yeah, and earlier, so we were being interviewed, Shock and myself, um, by the world press, really. And this, so this is 90, it was 91, yeah. And at one point, we were being interviewed by the guy who was the science editor of the Boston Globe, and Shock teaches in Boston, so he was a hometown boy, and so Shock gave his his interview, and Shock is, it, we're a good we're a good duo. It's, it's not exactly good cop bad cop, but you know Shock is always civil, and always professional, and always polite, really, even when he, <laughs> he shouldn't be. And I don't have to worry about these things. I can say whatever I damn please. 
So, I forget his name, Dave. Chandler, David Chandler, the science editor of, of the book. We should explain, before we go any further, we should explain the argument for people that don't understand it. The, uh, oh, the, okay. the water erosion argument. This is what people are trying to ignore. Um, there's, there's people that are still arguing that somehow or another that could have been created by sand and, and wind and that this erosion, um, the, it, it, according to most geologists, that's not the case. Most geologists are stating that it had to be water, correctly? That's that's correct, but now they've now they've actually gone off the sand and wind thing, and now it's supposed to be what's called um, salt crystallization, in which a water water soaks through the limestone and creates um, what's it called uh, uh, chemical reactions with the rock, and that weathers off and creates the weathering that we see. This is actually a nonsensical argument, which we will be addressing very shortly. I'll talk about And there's a, an incredible amount of resistance to this idea, even though the geological science, is there, are they exactly. in agreement on this? Almost, most of them. There are a few who aren't, and I'll get into this too as we go along. Okay. But you see, the point, what's at stake the, here, Joe, is not, this is not, this is not just a scholarly quibble, because for the Sphinx to be water weathered, and specifically by rainwater, means that it has to have been there when there was rain in Egypt. And you see, there's almost no rain there now, an inch or so a year. The Sahara Desert formed around 10,000 BC. Before that, it was fertile savanna, sort of like modern day Kenya, maybe even wetter than that. So for the Sphinx to be weathered by, by, by rainwater means, means that it has to have been there before, before or during the time that lots and lots of rain was falling. Now, what's at stake there? When you were saying before that civilization, according to the to the standard scenario, civilization begins around 3,000, 3,500 BC, more or less simultaneously in Egypt, in Sumeria, in China, in India, but all of it is around that date. But the Sphinx, you see, is is really is the most spectacular sculpture on Earth. It's 240 feet long and 66 feet high, and it's a magnificent, absolutely breathtaking sculpture, even in ruins. And the temples around it, which we'll get into somewhere along the line, but ideally I'll send you pictures of it. The temples around them are, are powerful stone, uh, uh, limestone buildings faced with granite. But what's interesting about them is not the size of the temples themselves. By Egyptian standards, they're not all that big. But the stones that, they're, that, are, that comprise them weigh somewhere between 50 and 150 tons each and they're set up in such a way they're slotted into places into place like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle we can't do that today if you saw the, the old the, the charlton heston video which evidently you've seen yeah have, we have this guy jesse warren who's the project manager of a where they're building a co-generation plant out in long island and he's acknowledging he's fascinated by this because he says, yeah, our biggest cranes, our biggest land-based cranes could lift these rocks, but we wouldn't know how to rig them so that we could get them into place. So what this means is that not just that the Sphinx, this fabulous statue, is much, much older, it is built before there's supposed to be any civilization at all, but it means that there's a technology in place that we, with our brilliant science that, you know, produce hydrogen bombs and bobblehead dolls and nerve gas and all of these wonderful new developments, we couldn't build the temples around the Sphinx. So that's why they're all so incensed. And absolutely, the whole idea is that we, if this is finally acknowledged, it means that everything, but everything that these people have believed about ancient, about the, the onset of human civilization is completely dead wrong. So that that's why they, that's why they're as angry as they are. An Air Force friend of mine said, "Good good line that uh, the flak is always heaviest when you're right over the target." You know, one of the things I learned from watching your documentary is I really thought that scientists and people that were studying the history of something as important as Egypt that they would be. We should just leave that sound on, Brian. Hey, I guess John, you have a, a fan going on in the background. Is that your computer fan? Yeah, that's the computer fan. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, you would think that these people would be scientific in their approach to evidence. When you guys presented this evidence that there was massive amounts of water erosion, 
the, the <laughs> one of the things the guy said that, that really disturbed me is like you're talking about a civilization from 10,500 years. He was mocking. He was saying, yeah. "Where's the evidence of this civilization? Yeah. Like, what 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 other evidence do you have of this civilization?" And it's the way he's yeah, saying it is so ridiculous and arrogant, and it right. was so there was it was so soaked in ego. Because the reality is, we don't really know how much evidence there would be left from 10,500 B.C. Uh, that is a long, long, long time ago. And it That's might right. very well be that the only things that remain are things like the Sphinx and the Sphinx enclosure. Well, there, there's, a, there's a good reason for that, too. Actually, Shock and I are, are about to set off on a, on a new book between us called Dancing Down the Bridge of Syrah. Uh, and then the subtitle is a scholar and a scientist fend off the unicorns and take on the paradigm police because the bridge of Sirah is a Sufi image, you know what Sufism is, right? It's the mystical aspect of Islam and there's a, a meta, it's, it's a metaphor in, in, in Sufi doctrine and the, the, in order to get to the truth, in order to get to enlightenment um, the, let's say the seeker must, must cross the bridge of Sirah which is described as narrow as a razor's edge and on one side is the chasm of credulity and on the other side is the is the abyss of skepticism so to do this stuff you really have to have an, i mean it's very difficult it's easy to say you have an open mind but you'd be surprised how few people have an open mind we've had some experience with this ourselves and when you say yeah you expect that from science they should be open to evidence but in fact they're not and <laughs> It's, it's a, so what is their issue? They don't want to admit that they're wrong and that everything they've been teaching for decades was incorrect yeah. and has proven so? So they hold on to the old truth? Well, exactly. But, I mean, in a way, I have a little bit of sympathy for them even because they put in all of these years and here's somebody who comes from out, absolutely out of left field, me, and, and shock, who doesn't come out of left field, who's one of them, a PhD geologist and highly respected and with a number of geological, you know, solid scientific books published who say you guys have it all wrong. And Well, explain to folks what your background is and why you're uh, such a, a rebel in this field. Oh, well, I'll tell you that. But in one second, let me, I don't, I don't want to lose the thread. About okay, I'm sorry. Because I have, no, it's okay. But when I'm on my, when I do, when I'm on my trips, people always ask, we're going through the evidence and instead of taking half an hour the way we are now, we've spent hours down by the Sphinx studying every aspect of the geology and so on. And, and they, they always say, well, how? Basically, what you said, there's the evidence. How can they deny it? And it's, I, I, I always recount an anecdote that, you know, it's funny, when I was a kid, I read this long before I was even interested in this stuff, but it was a teaching tale, supposedly a true one, that this was the 1940s, in Reader's Digest, and there was an, an, an anecdote in there that when Yasha, Yasha Heifetz, the great violinist, gave his debut at Carnegie Hall at the age of 11, I think this must have been 44 or 43, something like that, um, I was a kid, and, um, and at the concert was the then reigning violin virtuoso, a guy named Misha Elman, who you don't hear much of these days, but he was sort of the... the, the um, Pinkus Zuckerman of today, and with him was Artur Rubinstein, the great pianist. And about halfway through the concert, Elman turned to uh, Elman turned to Rubinstein, and he said, "Hot in here, isn't it?" And Rubinstein said, "Not for pianists." So, so, so with our with our science, the geologists have no problem with it, or the microbiologists, or the astrophysicists. But for the Egyptologist and the archaeologist, it's hot. So I mean, what can what can be done? I mean, w you guys have presented this evidence. They've tried to ignore it. But more things pop up that show that we might be uh, wrong about the history of humanity, like Gobekli Tepe. Right? Exactly, exactly. We now have the smoking guns at our, at our disposal. We, ha we have an arsenal of smoking guns. And you see, we have even more evidence than was in that video we presented, there's a lot more evidence just from Egypt that we presented in another GSA conference in 2000, again with the almost unanimous assent of the attending geologists, but that one unfortunately didn't have much press there, so it didn't, it didn't get a lot of press, 
the geologists were impressed, but it, it didn't go anywhere. But we now have, and we've had for a while, all of the evidence at our disposal, but Gobekli Tepe, which you mentioned, and I don't know how many of your audience will know about that, that's serious, that's the smoking gun, because here's this incredible site in Turkey, and Chuck and I have visited there and spent about a week there, that was discovered in 1994, and I hope we'll get the pictures of this up there, but it was discovered in 1994 absolutely by accident. It looks like a big hill. I mean, it is a big hill, and you'd never know that there was anything there. And in 94, a farmer was plowing the top of the field. It was his, it was his hill, and he hit what he thought was a boulder. And the plow hit the boulder, and he, he ran the plow back over the boulder to try to dislodge it, and it wouldn't dislodge, and they tried a couple of times, nothing happened except they bent their plow. And so they dug around it and they discovered that it wasn't a boulder after all, it was the top of a stone column. So they started digging some more, and then finally they called in the archaeologists, which now they're sorry about because the ar archaeologists commandeered the site. And these guys, 20 years, 15 years later, are fighting the Turkish government to get some kind of financial redress from st the stealing their hill. Anyway, oh, once, they, once they got excavating, they discovered that this is w one of the greatest archaeological discoveries probably of all time. I mean, from, from a, a historical point of view, it's even more significant than, let's say, Tutankhamun's treasure, because once they, they, they dug up the first of these and they found and they did ground penetrating radar and maybe seismographs, I'm not sure, but certainly radar. And this huge hill has at least 22 closely packed stone circles like mini stone hinges, but not so many. The, the, the central columns, there are central columns, two central columns in each of these stone circles and then ringed around with other stones. I mean, everybody listening to this or, or watching this will have an image of uh, of Stonehenge in, in, in their heads. So it's like that, except not as not as massive. But then further further as they were digging, they realized that this entire hill, which had been at one point or another exposed to the elements, of course, had been deliberately filled in. For what reason nobody knows? I mean, this is a lot. This is acres of land, and the thing had been completely covered. And they were able to date the fill, because the fill has all kinds of organic material in it. And so the fill they dated to 8000 BC. And Whoa. that means that the Gobekli Tepe itself, this incredible site, nobody knows what, it, what it's there for or who did it or anything, is at least 10,000 BC. And those central columns that I was talking about are 10 to 15 tons. They know that the, that the I think they're limestone, but the stones come from a quarry about three quarters of a mile downhill, so they have to drag these up. Now we're talking 10,000 BC. There's not supposed to be any civilization, much less tools or anything of that sort. So here are these, and there are 22 of these stone circles. Only four have been partially excavated. Wow. And not only Only are these four stones, out of 22. <laughs> Pardon? I said only four out of 22 have been excavated? It's, all this time, archaeology is an unbelievably, if it's done if it's done meticulously, and nowadays it tends to be, you know, not so long ago, it was just grave robbery, but now it's really meticulous. They're going at this stuff with teaspoons, so it takes them years and years and years to do it, and I guess there isn't a gigantic amount of funding available. I don't know who's funding it. It's a German team that's doing it with a really nice, really good guy named Klaus Schmidt, German archaeologist, who's in charge there, who's, you know, he's not into the esoteric side of things as Shock and I are, but He's a solid guy, as archaeologists go. He's pretty good, and uh, nice man too. Anyway, the apart from the size of these stones and, and the finesse that they're that they that they that goes into creating them, they're also elaborately decorated, and they're high relief. It's called high relief. In other words, let's say you want to do a you you want to carve in a wild boar or a bird or in one case a lion or some sort of a, of a feline, you, you cut the back, you cut the stone away so that the image springs out of the stone. This is 10 times more work than 
carving something into the stone. And this is all without any tools, as far as anyone knows, certainly any metal tools. It's done with flint somehow or another. And you've got acres of these things, and they, the archaeologists, do not dispute the dating of 10,000 BC or earlier. So that's our smoking gun. I mean, we've been looking at this for a long time, Jacques and I, we've been, and we found all kinds of evidence. And some of it, a lot of the evidence is really commanding, but it's not spectacular looking. Now it's spectacular looking. So what I found, I sorry, what I found amazing about it was that they were trying to attribute these constructions to hunter and gatherers. Well, maybe they are hunter and gatherers. I mean, you have to be a fool. If there's plenty of animals and stuff around, there are plenty of things around to eat. Why should you go to the backbreaking job of farming? <laughs> the food is plentiful. Actually, I have in my first nonfiction book. I don't know if you know this. I started out as a novelist, playwright, screenwriter, and you know I had a lot of things done. Never made me money, which is probably a good thing for Egyptology. But um, there's a, I don't know if you ever heard of him, but in, in the first book was called The Case for Astrology, which is out of print now, but which put together all of the scientific evidence that says there's actually something behind it. It's not just what's a good day to buy a poodle. So, the, in, this, in that book, I, that's my, as I said, my first nonfiction book, but I, I quote a, there's a wonderful ethnologist, oh, Conrad Lawrence, who was brought up in South Africa. He wrote a wonderful book, Bushman, probably still around, Bushman of the Kalahari, about his own experience. And he relates how the Bushmen of, of South Africa, the, the missionaries are trying to teach them how to farm. And the Bushman looks at him and he says, why should we farm when there were so many mongo mongo nuts in the world? Whatever that is. Why would anybody in their right mind bother to you know, plow the land and cut everything down? when you can go outside your door and fish and hunt all day. So just because they were hunter-gatherers doesn't mean they hadn't figured out amazing constructions, the ability to make these huge cities and these just... You bet. You bet. Yeah. And, and in this last, in the couple of decades, I mean, I've been on this quest for what? And I discovered all the Shwala de Lubitsch in the late 60s, so that's... I said, I've been at this for 50 years, yes. Something like that, close to it. And... And, but in the last 10 or 12, a whole lot of really interesting work has come to the fore, proving that not only in these, in these so-called primitive societies, that maybe were not intellectually sophisticated, they nevertheless had, they had a precise cosmological science. And actually some of, some of my pals involved in this, you may know some of them, but you may not know some of them, they might be interesting guests for you in, in upcoming shows if people, you know, people really, really get tuned into this sort of thing. So it's becoming quite clear that, that the knowledge was all there. I mean, the knowledge was there. The, the groundbreaking book was, you may know about it, was, it's called Hamlet's Mill. I've like, heard you discuss it. Do you know that? Have you discussed that one? Yeah, I've heard you discuss it. You're right. It's, it's Giorgio, I mean, these are two impeccable historians of science. At MIT, Giorgio de Santillana and, and Hertha von Deckend in the book is, I think, published in 68. But again, this is the thing you have to go through when you're, when you're dealing with these heretical things. I mean, these were guys with all of the right credentials, not like me. I mean, I come from out of left field. And they managed to stonewall them and try to, and try to ignore their evidence that underlying the world's mythology, all of these strange stories of, you know, incestuous gods and all of this kind of thing, was astronomy. And astronomy presupposes the, the Santayana and Von Deccan didn't go into that much because they were in enough hot water as it was, but there is absolutely no point to a sophisticated astronomy unless there's an astrology behind it, at least in the old days. Nowadays they're busy looking for quasars and black holes and all of that sort of thing, which have no meaning, at least, in, let's say, at least in the emotional or philosophical sense. But in the old days, whole civilizations, Egypt included, were attuned to the motions of the stars. In other words, the, 
there's, there's a lot of literature on this. Why do you think sources. that this? Why do you think that this culture that we live in right now is so reluctant to uh, accept anything like astrology? Why do you think they uh, would like to dismiss it so quickly? Well, because 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 this is a materialistic this is a materialist culture that denies anything that has any meaning. I mean, materialism is materialism, which is the reigning philosophy. This is what everybody learns in school. I mean, and you certainly get nothing esoteric out of school, nothing mystical, and unfortunately, the the the. The, skept the skeptics are basically rationalism, materialism, atheism. Basically, is it's 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 it's, it's basically the the religion of the emotionally defective and spiritually dyslexic, and and in contemporary materialistic science, value does not exist. In other words, it's it it, it, it value is by definition subjective. So these people are determined because they can't find any meaning in their own lives, in their own existence, to, to foist that emptiness, that nihilism, upon everyone else, but they call it rationalism or reason. It's nothing of the sort. It is, it is nothing but. Nothing. It but, just seems but. to reason that we, our bodies are affected by the moons and the tides and women's periods are and, you know, people behave differently during different moon cycles. The oceans, they're affected by the tides. I mean, that's affected by the... The fact that the moon can affect the oceans and we're mostly water. Wouldn't we just assume that planets are having some sort of an effect on sure. people? That's right. How, well, where did it all come from? Where did astrology originate from? Like, what is the what is the bottom? What is at the end of it? Like, who invented it? We we don't know, but but what we can say is that if if going back into the Paleolithic, now we're talking. I mean, we think actually those figures. Chuck and I think that the figures in the Paleolithic in in the uh, in Gobekli Tepe are, pro are probably cosmological and astronomical, well, we can't prove it yet. However, de Santillana and Van Dekan do a very good job of showing that that um, that astronomy under underpins the most ancient mythologies that we have. And since these guys, since the ancients are not just interested in quasars and, and pulsars and all of these sorts of things, it presupposes an astrology. And in fact, in Egypt, and Egypt is the one, the one you know, the one society that I know the most about, but the same, I'm sure, applies to ancient China and India and Mayans and so on, that the entire society is orchestrated in such a way that, that it is attuned to these cosmic cycles. And we still have, you know, there's a reason why Christmas is the day that it is, and there's a reason why Easter is the day that it is. It's supposed to, to commemorate Historically, in certain certain elements in the, you know, in the in the life of Jesus Christ, but actually that's it's much older than that, and and the the ancient societies knew what they were doing. I mean, when you get deep into Egypt, you see that their that life itself is a kind of a magical. It's like a magical recreation of the genesis of the universe, in which by celebrating it in certain ways and set certain kinds of ceremonies and so on, human beings are reliving the cosmic process and thereby accessing the divinity that is responsible for us being here, which is not supposed to, which is not creationism. You see, anytime you try to say to a rationalist scientist that, hey, there really is a meaning to life, that, oh, you're a creationist, you think the world was created in seven days. No, it doesn't mean that you know, God with a big white beard was up there in the sky saying, well, today I think I'll create mosquitoes. It has nothing to do with that. It's, it's a much more profound philosophy, but it, it is not amenable to study by a materialist science. But who said materialist science is the be-all and end-all and the answer to everything? Only the materialists say that. But they've got everybody, including the people who, in, who put the educational system together, conned into believing that their science is the only science. The ancients knew, knew much better, and they did much better. I mean, all you have to do 
is go to Egypt to experience these unbelievable temples and this fabulous art to understand that something is going on that isn't going on now. And this is one of the, I mean, <laughs> this is a big subject. We won't even get into it in an open-ended, in an open-ended talk like this. But this, this is what Chuck and I will be talking about in, in the book that we're, that we're planning, this Dancing Down the Bridge of Sirah. And, um, and in the video, the big follow-up to the Mystery of the Sphinx that we're hoping to put together the funding for, which we hope to do as a theatrical release, not just on television and so on, but, you know, get it out in the theaters first and then onto the videos and theaters and TV and all that sort of stuff. Because this is... You have to have, like, an animated dog or something to go with you to Egypt if you want to get it in the theaters to get people to really get uh, interested in the history of the Sphinx and all that stuff. That's going to be difficult to get in a theater. No, it's it Silly be, people actually. we have in no, this world. The, the, uh, the, I mean, we had... Our show, The Mystery of the Sphinx, was a huge success. Unfortunately, my ex-partner, now deceased, stole a whole lot, 250 grand from the till, so he never made any money out of it. And he oh, that dirty bastard. It. But he was an interesting guy, and without him, without him, it never would have happened, because he had the energy, and I mean, me, I, you know, I'm, I can think, but I don't. I'm not a manifester, and he got the whole thing going. So I don't, I don't begrudge. Maybe him. if you had a penguin, a penguin that travels to Egypt, and you get Morgan Freeman to narrate it. No, no? Joe, we don't need it. Actually, that video had was on Sweeps Week. It had it had a huge audience over the course of its lifetime. It still gets shown every once in a while. It was amazing. It was probably seen by. I tried to figure it out one day. It was probably seen by at least 250 million people over over the number of years that it was being shown internationally and so on. People are really interested in this stuff. Oh, absolutely. We don't get a chance to express it. We don't need any penguins. We just <laughs> need, in this case, we just need the science because, and the, you see, the material is, is glamorous in its own right. And now we have all of this other stuff. It's not just Egypt. We have Turkey. There are these, I don't know if you've seen this, the shock shock was very fascinated by Easter Island, which may be connected with these things. You know the Moai of Easter Island, right? Yes, yes. Did you know, did you know that up until quite recently, it looks like they're just kind of these big figures that are their heads, basically heads and torsos, right? Yeah. Well, somewhere along the line, I can't imagine why it took them a hundred years to two hundred years to figure it out. They started excavating these things, and they're finding that. They're full, full length yeah. statues. So, in other words, they have built up around them maybe 25 feet, 30 feet of silt. And now the question is, and this should be relatively easy to determine, this is part of our big project that we're calling it Zeptepi and the Dawn of Civilization, the follow up, the mystery of the Sphinx, because it should be possible to carbon date the lower layers of, of the fill. And, and our conviction is that these things may date back, again, thousands and thousands and thousands Can, of years. Have they done this? I mean, I've no, seen the excavations. No, well, they're excavating, but we don't know if they've done any carbon dating. Oh, they but have Shock to, though, friend. right? Shock has a buddy, a Chilean, who is the ambassador somewhere or another. Anyway, he's connected to Easter Island. He should be able to find out for us. And then not only is, you see, we've got all of this new stuff now. It's really exciting. The um, not only Gobekli Tepe, but have you heard about the bracelet that was found fairly recently in Turkey? No. Are you on? I know. I know Graham Hancock's been on your show. Are you, are you on his on that mailing list that he has? Um, I'm. I believe so. Steve not Trump sure. Runs. I Every get week some mail. He sends you. He sends out. I mean, that's his whole job. That's what he does, and and he sends out this enormously comprehensive list of everything that's interesting happening in science that either directly or tangentially affects this whole lost civilization hypothesis anyway are you familiar with the object that they found at the bottom of the baltic sea recently right? yeah what very recently like yeah big it looks like a millennium falcon it looks like you know if you uh, took the star wars spaceship millennium falcon and put it in the bottom of the ocean that's what it looks like they don't know what it is but they're sending divers down like i believe it's this week 
Oh yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, and there's uh, somebody saying, well, it's not that. We'll see when we'll see when they when they figure it out because you have to be seriously careful about that stuff. You know about Chuck and myself diving. Yes. You know about that. We are convinced. Graham thinks otherwise, but we are Chuck and myself convinced that this is amazing looking place is in fact perfectly natural wow really and explain yeah we can explain we can pretty well explain how it's done and we didn't want to think that that would have been our smoking gun but we're we're convinced that it's natural but you so saw those two giant before. you saw those two giant pizza box looking pieces of rock that were yeah, stacked yeah, next yeah, to yeah, each other side by side and you, you know did that look natural yeah to you? it's a hard listen it's you know it's hard to describe just you know without having the pictures there but if right. we had more time and i had the pictures with me we we could show you why we're convinced that it is indeed completely natural you've seen all the but, images on graham hancock's site i'm, I'm assuming yes yeah, all there did you but do any diving yourself at yanaguni yeah, yeah yeah we were there for a week and shock has been there a couple of times and he's as i said it's in our own interest hmm. to see this as to see this as the evidence we're looking for but we don't think it is, and we think Graham is making a big mistake by insisting well, that it is. Well, Dr. Shock is the geologist. What was his explanation for how it was created? How all those... Well, well, you see, if you go... <laughs> because the people who are taking the pictures initially, and it's, they're not trying to fool anyone, they're just taking the cool, exciting-looking pictures. But if you follow some of those ridges that look so perfectly vertical and so perfectly horizontal, you see them just kind of taper into disappear into the living rock face. And when you get really down there and you get your nose to the rock, you see that the the corners aren't finished. You see that the the, the, the rocks have been wrenched out of their place. It's a place that's dangerous diving there. And I'm not a diver. Um, very, very strong currents. And uh, I mean, I had a, a, a master diver glued to me um, to, to um, <laughs> make sure I didn't drown. But, but when you go down the shore, I mean, Shock and I went there and this very nice Japanese billionaire financed the whole thing who was really interested in it. And it was, we, we hated to do it, to, to be to wet blankets. But on the last day that we were there, we went, we went looking around the island and we were looking at other stuff. And we went to a place about a couple of miles um, from the actual Yonaguni site. And there, at the water's edge, and you see it's a, it's a certain kind of shale, it's a very hard shale formation that is laid down in very regular horizontals, but that is cross-cut by um, fault lines. And it, it's like if you imagine a gigantic stone layer cake that's already cut into pieces, but they haven't, the pieces haven't been served. And so what happens is that by the action of the wind and the waves, because this other formation, the similar formation, was right at the water's edge. And you could watch the waves pounding up against it and the current running. And what would happen is that eventually the water, the running water and the waves and tides and who knows, typhoons and all the rest, sort of work into the fault lines, which are the softer rock, you know, and, and eventually they get it to the point that the action of the waves pulls away a big chunk of rock. This is all set down in layers, so that falls into the water. And again, we're talking about thousands and thousands of years. Gradually, the whole, the whole piece of rock disappears because it's all laid down in these kind of layer cake, layer cake levels. And so we, when we saw this, we, because we had our own misgivings over the course of the week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was the last thing in the world we wanted to we right, you would be happier if you believed that it was an ancient civilization. Yeah, well, we had it all planned. I was going to write it up for the National Geographic or Smithsonian or something like that, and Chuck was going to write it up for the for the uh, you know, geological for the geological journals and all of that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, and we had to say, well, no. And did you see the stone circle? Uh, it's like uh, there's there's like pillars arranged in a circle. Yeah, Did you see those, that? Again, we, no? see, we're convinced we're convinced that there's no context for anything there, and and things that are not things that are man-made have a context. And as I said, when we when we saw we were still we would still 
completely uncertain about it if we did not go a couple of miles down and watch a similar sort of thing being formed right in front of our eyes. And I when see. we go back there, when we do this, our next this next film, Zeptevi, Yonaguni will be one of our one of our sites that you know, just assuming we can get the funding together, that we will be. Um, you know, we'll be concentrating upon because it's an object lesson, both in how, in how careful you have to be when you're looking, you know, that, I mean, we have a stake in this too. And as I said, when we had to give up on this, I, I had a moment, a slight pang, not much, because I don't really like the quackademics, but we had a slight pang of compassion for them when somebody comes along and destroys their paradigm, which is us. So, anyway, so you know, that's that, that's Yonaguni, and um, but anyway, oh, back to back to this incredible bracelet. This was just a couple of months ago. They found a bracelet somewhere in Turkey. Turkey's turning out to be more and more interesting. There are all kinds of great places in Turkey, and the it's, just, it's a, a round bracelet made of obsidian. Now, obsidian is an incredibly hard stone and very difficult to work. And they dated, I'm not exactly sure how they dated it, maybe in the, where it was found, the, the, you know, the strata where it was found. They dated it to around 8,000 BC. But the, the, it's a very elegant, little, I mean, it didn't look like that much. It's just elegant and beautiful. And the archaeologists, realized when they studied it that the finish on it was something that nowadays you could only do with the most sophisticated um, instruments, lasers or something of the sort, and moreover that it had a very complex and subtle geometrical shape. So in other words, you can't do a thing like that, or it's very hard to imagine doing some, something of that nature that's really rigorously geometrical without having the geometry at your fingertips. So you'd so have to have some sort of a computer, a machine, something has to, you have to have something that you're, you, you built to construct this, right? Is that what you're we saying? Don't, we don't know. This is, this is the contention of Chris, Christopher Dunn. Do you know Chris? No. Um, no. He's a pyramid. Well, he's, he's a high-tech guy. I mean, he designs, I forget what kind of an engineer he is, but he's the guy who designs the instruments sort of the really precise instruments that do things like make pieces for the space shuttle and stuff. They're instruments that, you know, are calibrated to ten thousandths or hundred thousandths of an inch. And he's done studies in Egypt and finds that that's what you see all over the place, that there are, you know, monstrous pieces of granite. And you put this, because he's been on a couple of trips with me, he's a good guy. And he, he has his fine special instruments that you know, are calibrated to a ten thousandth of an inch, and he places this on, on, on you know, on a, on, a, on a piece of granite, an old kingdom granite, and the granite is one hundred percent completely true. And and Chris is, you know, is is fairly adamant that in order to do this, they had to have had some sort of technology that would allow them to do that. Well, Shock and, and I are, are not so sure because. Technology is technology, unless they have some miraculous form of technology that we can't even imagine, because you would have expected, particularly in a place like Egypt, where you have so much from the past, that somewhere along the line you'd have some evidence of it, of this kind of technology, and you don't. So we don't. You mean have. you mean by saying technology, you mean something that cuts the like a, a machine, something that can cut the marble and polish it down. To be 100% yeah. flat? Yes, exactly. What You'd is the conventional, what is the, do conventional Egyptologists, how do they say they built it? They don't even, they don't address the question. I mean, since there is no, since there is no, um, there is no evidence for that technology, they just assume that they did it by hand somehow or another. And maybe they did, but when you realize the level of perfection of these things and how impossible it would be today to do them by hand. Um, I mean, they just say, oh, well, in those days, everybody had lots of time and time was no, was not of any concern, so they could work on it until they got it right. Well, 
that's a sort of a fudge. But on the yeah. other hand, you can't legitimately postulate an advanced technology when you don't have any evidence for it. Right. There was another issue with the vases, correct? The the stone right. vases that were made that we can't duplicate today. No. Or maybe we could, but we'd have to go. We'd have to use a lot of very special machinery to do it. And since there's no evidence that I had this kind of machinery, you know, there are these round you know, vases that are, you know, um, they're, they're shaped like this, and and they have a, a narrow neck and they're hollow on the inside, and and they're perfect. I mean, they can you know they can t look at, into the inside and see that the inside is hollowed out perfectly. And we can't, we don't know how they could possibly have had what kind of a drill or anything they could have had to do this. And they're very hard stone vases, and they date from a very early dynastic Egypt, not, um, you know, not a later period. They lost the ability. This is one of the strange things. Some of the most spectacular stuff comes from the earliest periods. In fact, right now, there's a terrific, there's a terrific show in the... Uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art called, I think, The Dawn of, of Egyptian Art. And it's all the pre-dynastic work, uh, 4,000, 5, 3, 4, 5,000 BC. And they've collected, it's not, you know, it's not, as they do a retrospective, they get uh, bits from here and bits from there and so on. So they put together this really fabulous show because normally you don't see much pre-dynastic art together in one place. And when you look carefully and you see what's going on and you know what you, you know you, what you're looking at, I mean, if it was somebody who's not spent 30 years studying Egypt, you know, they'd look, they'd be really um, impressive bits and pieces. They're mostly quite small, but if you have an eye for this and you've done a lot of study and asked a lot of questions, you see how spectacularly beautiful these things are. So it shows on till August. So anybody in the neighborhood. Um, make sure you get to the Met. It hasn't had an awful lot of press, but it's it's a terrific show. So you guys want to put a date of the civilization of Egypt to somewhere around 30,000 B.C. That's your idea, right? Yeah, probably. It could even be earlier. We don't know. Actually, we're... Let me backtrack a little bit. My, my question is, how did some, one civilization like Egypt, how did that one thing rise up? And it, it seems so much more advanced than any civilization anywhere, anywhere around it. Like, how did that take place so well, long ago? It might have been that much different. You see, it, it, the, the physical situation of Egypt is such, because it's bone dry, so there's, you know, nowadays, I mean, since 4,000... But your, you, your, your theory... Dry. I'm sorry, your theory puts it in a time where it wasn't, though. Your theory oh, puts well, the creation was, of yeah. Egypt in a time where it was lush and rained all the time. It was essentially well, a rainforest. Well, that takes it way back further. But then we've got Gobekli Tepe. Now we're talking 10,000 B.C. And who's to say what they haven't discovered yet? And what was I mean, the climate? Was an in accidental find. So, and, and the other civilizations, you see, Egypt has this physically, physically unique situation where things don't, weather away. I mean, once they get covered up with sand, they're just there. And plus the fact that, you know, in the old days, this was a this was a kind of blessed civilization in which you hardly had to do any work to get fed. Either the Nile would flood and you planted some seeds and they grew up. When the, when the, flo when the flood season came again, we had a fairly populous, um, you know, there, was, there was a substantial population there with nothing to do, no television, no American Idol, nothing to do all day long or all night long. And so they, they, they you know, they, the whole, the entire society was put to work building these fabulous, these fabulous temples and monuments and doing the artwork and so on. So the other places, I mean, I'm pretty well convinced because the doctrine, the, in all of this work in the last decade or so, proving that the cosmology, in other words, the sophisticated understanding of life and significant significance of life and the geometry and the astronomy and so on was all there universally. India and China and the other places just didn't have the physical capacity to build on that scale, or maybe they just plain didn't do it anyway. Um, they had other ways of manifesting uh, this kind of 
let's say, this kind of understanding. And this is another thing that is just not even taken into consideration by the academics. You don't need sacred architecture, you know, magnificent sacred architecture to express spirituality. You could have a society, and there probably are some, that express their, let's say, their, their, their spiritual longings it's only in dance. And at the end, you would have no, in, you'd have no, no evidence. evidence even of the society. Right, that's and a very good are, point. For example, there are sacred dances. In the Gurdjieff work that I do, they have what are called the movements. And boy, you get into these things. I mean, they're pretty amazing. And yet, I mean, we do them today, but because he, you know, they, 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 sacred dance exists in, in lots of different societies. But you don't need to build temples in order to express it. The Egyptians did it that way. And the Chinese and the Indians did it too, but not that early, and there isn't that much left of it. But how did this civilization just spring up like this, though? They, they created know. such incredible works of art, incredible work, you know, the, the, the architectural designs of these, these buildings. No. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. But when you see, that was, see, that's one of the eye openers of this very interesting um, Dawn of Civilization exhibit at, at the Met, because, you, I mean, you don't have temples and you don't have, you don't have big buildings, but you have very many instances of very sophisticated sculpture done with very hard stones, I mean, beautifully finished. So they had it, they could do it. And as I said earlier, You've got Gobekli Tepe. There's no argument about Gobekli Tepe. If the Moai of Easter Island turn out to be ancient, well, then they are. I mean, if if if, if you can date, I mean, it's sort of amazing that they haven't done it, or maybe they haven't. I don't know about it. But if you can if you can show that that the earliest levels of fill that that have buried them up to their chests goes back to, let's say, go back to Tepe time, well, then you've got another instance of spectacular artwork at a time when there's not supposed to be such a thing. I mean, the whole thing is in the process of, of being turned upside down, ideally by us. It's, it's an incredibly fascinating subject and one that it, it, it drives me crazy. It's uh, it, the, the, the timeline is a, such a, a fascinating thing like where did civilization emerge from when how did it get so incredibly sophisticated at one point in time ancient egypt and then somehow or another all that stuff was lost you know somehow or another through the burning of the library of alexandria and the romans and the greeks and everything throughout history up until today so much information has been lost is is there a natural disaster in the middle of there somewhere? Did something happen to the human race where it wiped could out a significant number of us and then we had to refigure things out? Is that what happened? Well, could be, or it stayed there and, and sort of in a, in a dormant state until it was time to, to reinvent it. And actually, it does go further back than that. For example, you see, when you're dealing with the with crackademia, um, they, they're very resistant to to interpreting their own data in any way that disagrees with their preconceptions. But you're familiar for sure with the Paleolithic caves, right? Yes. Of southern France, of Lascaux. Do you know the one, um, the most recent one discovered in, in the early 90s called Chauvet, also in the same area? Do you know that one? No, I don't know that one. C-H-A-U-V-E-T, I think. Unless it's and what's going on in that one? Z. And and this was discovered, it's named after the guy who discovered it. And this is, I mean, up, up until now, the most, spectacular of, the most spectacular of the caves was the one at Lascaux with the famous Hall of Bulls, and the other one at the place called Altamira, which again is a very high level of artwork. And both of those, both of those caves are dated to around 17, 18,000 BC on the basis of evidence in the caves. Well, Chauvet has the most spectacular art of all. I mean, it's, it's as though it were designed by a, you know, drawn by a whole bunch of paleo Picassos. I mean, it's spectacular stuff. When you, when you pull it up on, online, you'll see it. And Spell it again, please. C-H-A-U-V-E-T. 
or V E Z. I think C H A. Oh, you were right the first time. I think it's V E T. Yes, it is. Wow, this Pretty is sure. amazing stuff. You got it up right. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, some of it. Now this. Now you see, this they date to 31,000 B C. Wow. Yeah, 31,000 wow right. B C. But they don't. See, they don't put two and two together. They can't do higher mathematics in academia, because two and two tells you that artwork at this level. And I mean, where, where are they getting the paint from? What are they doing with their fingers? Presumably, they can't go into the local art supply shop and get you know get acrylic paints. They're painting this on the inside of a cave. <laughs> it's got to be pitch black. And when you look at the level of artwork, you realize that. This is not done by primitives. In order to to do art of that of that level, you have to have your act together. Even if you're wearing bearskins, you know. And, yeah, it really <laughs> does look like the animals they're chasing, and it's all done from memory. That's very impressive. Well, we we Shank and I think that because the, he's been a very good guy. I haven't been in touch with him for forever for a long time. He was at a conference that we did named Frank Edge, who interpreted the Hall of Bulls at Lascaux as an astronomical, basically as having astronomical significance, sort of dots and daubs on the wall that represented the Pleiades and other constellations. And I think he's probably correct. And it wouldn't surprise me, see, the usual explanation is, oh, well, it's magic because if they paint the wall, these animals on the wall, they'll be able to hunt them. I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm more inclined to think that it may be in some in some way or another a star map or have some sort of cosmological significance. I mean, there's a book, for example, by a French member of the Academy, actually called Jean Richet, called The Sacred Geography of Ancient Greece. No, it's another one. It's a different one than that. That's one book. There's another one by uh, amateurs, in other words, not not credentialed, whatever, not that that means anything, called Plato's Secret Iliad, in which they show that the Iliad, which is the most boring book ever written, is actually a gigantic, it's like a planetarium, and all of these, you know, the so-and-so is being killed, and the, the you know, the, 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 the heroes are here, and the armies are doing all of this sort of stuff. It's a terrible bore to read. But if it's decoded as a star map, like as a, like a planetarium in action, from about 9,000 BC on, the whole thing makes all of a sudden vivid sense. This is where they're going to all of that trouble to do all of this work. Decoded so they, as a sky map? How? How do you decode it as a sky map? Oh, it's, you have to read the book. It, it, it's 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 complicated because the stars. Let me see if I remember correctly. The armies represent constellations. The heroes are the particular bright stars in the in the in the particular constellation. And the Iliad is all about this army is going here and that army is going here and this one is overpowering this one. And if you decode it astronomically, it, it's tracking the constellations across the sky because the, the relationships of the stars and the constellations to each other change over time. So as, as everybody knows. Why it, should they do that? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> but, do you, as I said, the astronomy, and this is now even getting, even the academics are, are realizing that 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 astronomy plays this huge role in very ancient civilizations, and the only reason, as far as I'm concerned, but I can't prove it, the only reason has to be that it is astrologically significant, because otherwise, who would care? I mean, for example, Hamlet's Mill. Um, the Santiano and Van Decken go to a lot of trouble to show that very ancient myths, as far back as you go, know about the procession of the equinoxes. I was just you, about to ask you about that. What? I said I was just about to ask you about that. That's, a, that's amazing. Of, Explain that to people. <laughs> Okay, the procession of the equinoxes is because, supposedly because of the wobble of the Earth, but there are other other explanations that I like better, of the whole solar system that's turning around a, a, a binary star. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. The, the, the fact is that, let's say, if you look the way that this, 
now we're still in the age, let's say we're in the age of Pisces, which means that if you look at the spring equinox, if you watch, wait for the sun to rise, it's rising an hour before the sun rises, you see the sun coming up, and the constellation behind the sunrise is the very last degrees of Pisces. And pretty soon, it's, it's, you can't get it precisely, pretty soon it will be Aquarius, so the age of Aquarius, you know, from the, what was it, hair or whatever the, the musical was. Now, very gradually, it's called the precession, the, the entire zodiac precesses against the the sun so in other words it doesn't go when you look at astrology aries is you know is whatever it is april 20 march 22nd and then it goes it goes aries taurus gemini cancer and so on precesses means it goes backwards so it's in pisces now and it'll soon be in aquarius now the 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 rate at which it, that cycle takes canonically it's actually not exactly that 25,920 years. So what this means is that for the sun to precess one degree takes 72 years. Now, how do they figure that out? And why should it be important? Can you imagine looking at the sky? How many people have to be looking at the sky for some reason or another and realize that the sun takes 72 years to go one degree? There was a book that Graham Hancock had uh, discussed once on an interview. I wish I could remember the name of it, but it was discussing this this number seventy two, and that this this knowledge of the procession of the equinoxes has been installed in many many ancient cultures and religions. So exactly, it has, and that gets you into number symbolism, and that gets you into sacred geometry. So it lets us know that they knew a lot more than we thought they knew, uh, just about the universe itself, the constellations sure. themselves the wobble of the Earth's axis, a 26,000-year cycle. They knew about this somehow or another 10, 15,000 years ago. Right. That's right. That's yeah. incredible. It is. <laughs> and, and you see, it's, it's this kind of thing that is rigorously excluded from any kind of academic discussions until it's stuff down their throats which is exactly what we plan to do the current the the conventional <laughs> egyptologists date the construction of the pyramids to 2500 bc right is it correct yes what, what's that what's that based on well it's based on the it's based on the reigns of khufu cheops kafra kefren and so on and this is again this is very complicated because we're, Chuck and myself and our colleagues, think that in all likelihood the, the pyramids that we see today are, do indeed date from that period. However, and this is again formally easily provable, they are built, they are either superimposed or replaced structures that were there earlier. And even the academics acknowledge that the Giza Plateau was was a single template. There's some very interesting work coming up soon proving that that's the case. So whenever the Sphinx was built, there were also structures there. We don't know if there were pyramids or not, but in the pyramids, particularly the second pyramid, the Khafra pyramid that's associated with the Sphinx, you can see that there are two different styles two radically different styles of masonry in it. The lower, the lower courses are built of these gigantic blocks the size of practically the size of this room. Well, not quite, but anyway, massive, maybe 80, 100 ton blocks. And then piled on top of them are the much, and very finely finished, are the much lesser, smaller, cruder masonry that's rather typical of, of the old kingdom. Now, whenever I mean, in architectural history, no architectural historian would, I mean, an architectural historian knows instantly that when you see two different styles of architecture in the same building, you know you're looking at two different periods of building. I mean, just as a rough example, suppose you have a Victorian house, but you've got a modern kitchen in it. A hundred years from now, or 500 years from now, if the archaeologists come and discover that house, they will know in two seconds that the house is built in the 1900s 
or the 1800s rather, and the kitchen is built in 2005 or something of that sort. So this is a given. So when you see two different, radically different styles of architecture, you know you're dealing with two different periods, um, two different periods of construction. And then there are other factors in this, the so-called Red Pyramid um, and Dashur, which is about 20 miles away, where the whole pyramid is built and the interior chambers are in perfect condition, are built over a ruinous megalithic chamber that they call a plundered tomb chamber, but it's not a plundered tomb chamber because the, the stones in it have been exposed to the weather for a long, long time. It's an earlier megalithic construction. We don't know what the dating is, but all of this you see is, is evidence that we will be using in our Zeptepe if we manage to put the budget together and do it. And there's a great history of people building on top of ancient structures, the, right. the Parthenon and the Acropolis. And where, right. the, where, which doesn't get explained. The, you know, nobody explains where those gigantic stones came from and why they, you know, how they got into place. Massive, right. monstrous stones. And yep. so the other thing that you guys had shown that I thought was really fascinating was that below ground, when you uh, showed the really ancient constructions, a lot of them were uncovered. A lot of them had to be dug out. They were, they were actually, the, the, the ones that were under the ground, under the sand, were the ones that showed the earlier construction methods, which is pretty obvious that, much like the Sphinx when they first discovered it, it had been taken over by sand. This is, you're talking about really, really ancient stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, the Sphinx is a bit different because it's cut into a hollow. In order to produce the Sphinx, they had to carve, quarry the stone around from it. So once it, why they did that in the first place, nobody really knows. But once they did it, once Egypt turned to, turned to desert, you leave it for 20, 25 years without sweeping it out, it goes buried right up to the neck again. Who, uh, what, who was responsible for cutting the face into the Sphinx? Oh, uh, we don't know. We're convinced, we're convinced that it was recarved because it's much too small for the body. It's, it's disproportionate to the body. And it's, it, a, yeah, it's, it's in it's, better shape. Well, it looks in better shape for two reasons. One, it's a much harder outcrop of stone, and B, it's been restored, the headdress and all of that. If you look at old photos of the Sphinx, say, taken around 1900 or so, um, you see that it's really much more weathered than it's looked, but they've repaired the, 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 the face and so on. But, I mean, this has all kinds of repercussions. For example, well, you know the story, um, the, we were doing the video, Mark Lehner, Who's the the, the the you know the, the loyal opposition, as it were, in the in the 80s? Because the Sphinx is supposed to look like the the Pharaoh Khafra. He doesn't look the least bit like the Pharaoh Khafra. But Lehner did an early computer study when back in the 80s, when computers were still pretty primitive, in which he fed Khafra data into the pyramid, and sorry, into the computer, and then superimposed the results upon the head of the Sphinx and said, voila, the Sphinx is Khafra. Well. To us, this was sort of silly, but it got a lot of press. It was in the New York Times and I think the Smithsonian, all over the place. So when we finally got funding together to do our Mystery of the Sphinx, we really had to address that because it was, it was, um, it was well known. And you know, people say, well, you know, it's been proved that the Sphinx is the face of Khafra. So how do you disprove it? Well, I wanted to, I wanted to actually use exactly the same method that Lehner used, but feed Elvis data into the computer and prove that the Sphinx was really meant to be Elvis. But the, uh, we thought that was a cool idea. But what happened was that the Elvis Foundation wouldn't let us use the King's image in that context. And I think Elvis would have been furious. He would have loved to have been the Sphinx. But what happened then was my my criminal partner, Boris, who was an interesting guy, he was an ex-race ex, uh, driver, he drove for Ferrari for years and a year for Porsche, he was an interesting character. Anyway, he came up with the idea, well, let's get a forensic detective to go with us to Egypt to, you know, do a study of these faces and see if they really could be the same, modeled upon the same human being. And so, a phone, couple of phone calls and we got in touch with a guy named Frank Domingo, who was the senior forensic detective from the NYPD. And he came to Egypt 
with us, and this is more a long story about how we got Frank to agree to go. And he did his study and, and showed unquestionably that the two faces could not possibly have been the same. And then the question came up, because when you look at the profile of the Sphinx, even though it's pretty ruinous because it's been, you know, been very severely damaged, even though it was damaged, it's quite clear that not only is it a different face than that of Kafra, but it's probably a different race. In other words, it really looks like a sub-Saharan African face, not even like, not like an Egyptian face. Which would mean it was <laughs> done by the Nubians who took over Egypt. Uh, not even the Nubians, early, you know, further earlier. south. Because the Nubians, the Nubians don't look like, don't look the same quite as the as the, as the sub-Saharan Africans. So, and in fact, the 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 Egyptology, the Egyptian Egyptologists are as prejudiced as everyone else. The last thing they want to know is that, you know, is that the Sphinx is a is is a, is, a, is an African African, and but in the, in the earlier in the 19th century. Lots of, of people just, you know, there was no Egyptology then. Lots of travelers, um, Gustave Flaubert and Florence Nightingale and all kinds of people who wrote very beautifully about Egypt, traveling in Egypt in the, in the 19th century, said, well, you know, this is a, a Negroid face. And the, the Egyptologists simply ignored that. Well, anyway, with Frank, so he did this careful forensic study. I think it's on my website. I'm not sure. Actually, I should tell some people my website's jawest.com or .net. And uh, anyway, it's in there somewhere. And um, so we asked him about it. That that um, you know, what do you think? Is can this be an African face? And Domingo is um, you know, cautious, but he said, well, he said you can't prove that it is, but it is consistent with sub-Saharan, sub-Saharan physiognomy and so so actually that was actually my friend Boris was very my, my partner was very funny when he said that he said boy this is bad news for the for the academics he said not only he said first of all it means that you know there is an Atlantis well there was an Atlantis and second of all they were black so <laughs> we, thought, we thought that was pretty funny uh, but anyway Subsequently, I, I did an op-ed piece for the New York Times, and I carefully left out this whole, because this was, you know, we wanted to go back there and do some more work, and I was in enough hot water with the academics to begin with, so I didn't mention anything about this sub-Saharan African Sphinx, but a few weeks later, the New York Times published a letter from a, an orthodontist, a Massachusetts orthodontist, and an orthodontist is another expert in, in facial you know, in, in faces, and he came up with it. Not us. He came up with it and said, "Yeah, this is this is an African face." So that was very interesting. And now, when we when we write our book, when we write the shock and I get cracking on the bridge of Syrah, we will go into that and actually interview, um, track him down. I, I lives in Newton, Massachusetts. The, uh, the the orthodontist who wrote that that letter and see what he has to say about it. But anyway, that was. That was an interesting thing about the about the, the head of the Sphinx that it's not original to the to the fate to the to the Sphinx because it's much too small proportionately to the body, and it seems to be a sub-Saharan African face. We don't know when it was recarved, but maybe the Sphinx if the Sphinx is, thir- is, is as we think over thirty thousand years old and it has to be recarved and at a, 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 some period of time in between. Well, it may be that, you know, that's who was living in Egypt at the time. That was the civilization of Egypt. You see, when you get back far enough, there's not much left. I mean, this is why, for example, the Paleolithic caves, you know, there were a bunch of caves, but nothing else. We don't know what anybody else was doing. Along comes Gobekli Tepe and suddenly the whole, everything changes because you've got this extraordinary structure that they date to 10,000 BC. So this comes up and it's very difficult to create 
a detailed picture of what was going on then. Why are they doing work on the Sphinx? Why are they like fixing the paws and fixing the ears and or fixing the headdress and all the the different things that they've done to the Sphinx? That seems to me to be very confusing. I mean, you have this amazing ancient structure and they're building on it to like recreate the the toes of the lion and it just seems very odd to me. Well, it, it is actually very odd. I mean, it really is. When you get up next to it, it's pretty crumbly, and so and but there's the, the jury's still out if the repairing, if the repairs are not actually doing more damage than would be done if they just left it to the elements. We don't know, but they are doing it, and and very often they're doing it, and it's a pretty botched up job. It looks terrible. Yeah, it does mostly look pretty. There's terrible. like little bricks, bricks on the you, toes. Yeah, yeah, it's really. It's really quite horrible, but it, you see, it's been repaired. The repair campaigns, it's not just modern. The earliest repair campaigns, this is another piece to the big puzzle, the earliest repair campaigns are Old Kingdom. In other words, the time that the Sphinx was, the time that the Sphinx was supposedly built, it was already weathered. Well, isn't that part of the hieroglyphs involved in attributing to one particular pharaoh's name that he fell asleep and he had a dream that if he uncovered the Sphinx, he would control right. Egypt? Yeah, that's... Tutmosis the III, third, which is the about fourth? 1400 B.C. And, and in that tablet, that stela, there was, it's subsequently flaked off, the, the first syllable of Kafra's name, Kaf. And from that, they... they they deduced, they extrapolated rather, and said, oh, well, Kafra must have been the builder of the Sphinx. But there's nothing that says that. What we think is that Kafra was the repairer of the Sphinx because even, I mean, Mark Lehner, the, the loyal opposition, notes that when the Sphinx was first repaired, it was already weathered to its present condition. And he nevertheless says that, oh, well, the, 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 the the old kingdom blocks that were repaired it were cannibalized from somewhere else it's really a cockamamie explanation but you know when you when you're playing in their arena and they don't like what the evidence is they move the goalposts and if that doesn't work well then they change the rules of the game is it their contention is the con conventional contention that the sphinx was carved with that face originally yeah, they they even though it's way out of even though it's but way it, out um, it, even though it's even though it's much too small proportionately, and the rest of the Sphinx is is, is spectacularly accurate proportionally. Well, not the only that, were masters no. of proportion, they they stick with that because it's too inconvenient. You know, you don't until you've dealt with these guys, <clears throat> and other fields of science or scholarship are not much different. People are. Particularly men, very <laughs> stubborn. Change. You know, we're 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 upsetting the apple cart, and they make a living selling apples. So well, what doesn't that. make any sense to me is that that's they're they're completely discounting the actual hard evidence of erosion. There's a very that's different that. level of yeah. erosion on the face than there is on the but rest of the body. But that's okay because that's a much harder that's a much harder outcrop of limestone. <clears throat> so that's been fully exposed whenever it was carved fully exposed and it's not really weathered that much but more than it looks because if you look at the old photographs you see the back of the head has been fairly severely weathered but nothing like the body yeah that seems crazy right actually what you have to do Joe is you gotta come to Egypt with us I would love to I'm scared though isn't Egypt scary right now isn't it dangerous no no well not really only if you're see, like trying to run it no the this is the these are the prostitutes who it's not that they're lying, but only unrest is news. So even under the worst of circumstances, when the revolution was going on, I was there for the entire revolution, and I refused to leave with the group that I was with. I lead to Egypt, you know that. And um, why did you refuse to leave? What? Why did you refuse to leave? Because the government said to, we were supposed to leave, and we said the hell with this. We're, they're not. They're not after us. So let's see what happens. So we waited wow. a few days, and the tanks were in the streets and all of that sort of stuff, and you could smell the tear gas, but nobody was after us. So there were a few places we didn't get to, but for the rest, we had the time of our lives because here we were, the only gringos in Egypt. And 
it was quite an experience when you used to, you know, crowds like the Super Bowl to be there when the place was empty. And we did miss a couple of places, but we had this fantastic time. So in the middle of the revolution, you're taking tours on and, and through the, the Sphinx and the Temple yeah. and Man and all that? Yeah, they were not, they're not after us. <laughs> they were happy to have us there. And, and Wow. Fact, That's a dude who's dedicated to Egyptology. When you see... No, and, and again... See, at the, at the worst in the revolution... They were talking about this. There were a million people protesting in a couple of different cities. But if there are a million people protesting, it means that there are 82 million who aren't. So all you have to do is not be on Tahrir Square where the protests are going on, which nowadays with cell phones is very easy to avoid. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. And they're not after us. They like having us there. We're, very so we're a source of income to them. So I'm still doing my trips, actually. <clears throat> and... And, you know, it's not as easy to get them together because I have to go through this explanation all the time. But this is the time to go. Tourism is running at about 20%. So you <laughs> go there and have this, everything for this, yourself. That revolution is good for business. Well, no, it's terrible. It's for terrible business, for business, but, it's but okay for us. good for the it's experience. A, yeah, and actually, I, um, in fact, as I said, the next, trip is in, the next trip is in October. And I have a... I mean, you, with your interest, you, you owe it to yourself to get to Egypt. I do. I have a friend who's been... Uh, the only ancient ruins I've ever seen were Mayan ruins in Chichen Itza. That's, uh, that's cool. about as, as far as I've seen. Well, they're pretty impressive. But Egypt is a different kettle of civilization because this, we know so much about it. Yeah, well, you, you know so much. If I did go, I would unquestionably go with you. Uh, Magical Egypt, that DVD series that you have, is one of my all-time... My, my wife would come into the room and, and look at me and go, Fucking Egypt again? Because uh, I'd be <laughs> sitting there watching this DVD series. She's like, how many of these are? There's like eight DVDs. So eight, I'm, yeah. how many DVDs is the Magical Egypt set? Eight. Eight. Right. It's amazing. I've watched yeah. it thirty times. I just go back and watch it over again. But you know, it got to. A, she got a little pissed off at me. She was like, "Enough, stupid!" Because I was watching it in the bedroom. You well, know, well, and then she well, would well, come in and have to see but sphinxes and shit. <laughs> Is she not is she not interested in it? Oh no, she is a little bit, but oh. not not to the extent. I'm a very obsessive person and when I first uh watched your this uh the documentary you did with uh, Charlton Heston narrating the, that I became obsessed with the whole idea of uh and then I bought Graham Hancock's book and then it was all downhill. Oh, it's a huge. I mean and, and it's really going exponentially now, but actually I I have on my on my list here I wanted to to mention it to you because you you have a pretty big audience and i have a i have a standing incentive offer that anybody who gets 10 people together to go on an egypt trip gets a freebie well minus the minus the, uh, minus the airfare and the bakshish the tips what but, we might do sir know, is we might buy out the whole thing buy well, out your you whole could. tour and then brian are you down are you down to go to egypt I'm talking to my yeah. co-host. My co-host says, fuck yeah, he's down to go. And we'll get all our friends <laughs> together, except Joey, because Joey can't leave the country. And uh, we'll, we'll take a death squad tour to Egypt. That, that might be that would shit. That would be amazing. Well, I would, I'd, I'd be down with that. Would it be safe to take children? Yeah, normally, but, but how old are the kids? Really young, two and four. You know, they're portable at that age, but, <laughs> but, but it's, it, it can be done. It can but, be done. That's not what I want to hear. I want to hear, yeah, it's like Disneyland. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, see, it depends on the kids, but that's, they're not going to get anything out right. of it. Right, oh, at yeah. 10, 12, 14, they do get something out of it. But what you can do is, you know, the, the, the Egyptians love kids. So you just, wherever your hotel is, you, you know, you hire a nanny who plays with the kids while we go out and look at That's not going to happen. No, yeah, that'll, that'll right. never happen. Uh, but um, l l let's talk about um, the Temple in Man, because that was one of the most fascinating things of that Magical Egypt series, was how the Egyptians, the, the, their construction wasn't just beautiful, wasn't just uh, functional art. There, there, was, there was a methodology to what they were making, where they were literally in that one temple, they mirrored the human body. Uh, explain explain that because it's really a fascinating it's a like a tribute to the human anatomy well it, it's not only is it a tribute to the to the human anatomy but it's 
Schroller de Lubitsch, the, the, the great genius with the unpronounceable name, um, I mean, names mean a lot. For example, Einstein is a great name for a genius. I mean, his name was Manny Plotnik. No one ever would have heard of him. Right. But, but Schroller, Schroller de Lubitsch, um, was a genius scholar. I mean, he really was brilliant. And and he realized it's a, again more long story. You read Serpent in the Sky? You read my book? No, I have not. Ah, okay. Well, Serpent in the Sky. Anyway, it's called Serpent in the Sky. It's called Serpent in the Sky: The High Wisdom of Ancient Egypt. I have to send you a copy. Anyway, um, he realized as he was doing the work on the on on Egypt on on the Temple of Luxor, he had actually. He went to Egypt. He was a very interesting man. Died in the early '60s. I never met him. Um, and he was a practicing alchemist. There were not many of those floating around these days. Um, but he went to Egypt because, according to the, and I only realized this quite recently. I thought the opposite until quite recently. But you see, the the Egyptian tradition percolated down through the West in what are, what are called the, the Hermetic tradition, which is astrology and magic and number symbolism and neoplatonism and a whole bunch of these other disciplines never coherent as in Egypt and Schwaller went to Egypt in 37 in order to to see if because the 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 Renaissance scholars people like Giordano Bruno and Kepler and all of them were convinced I mean they, they took it on trust that Egypt was the fount of, of wisdom. The Greeks agreed with that too, but nowadays it's not supposed to, civilization is supposed to have started with the Greeks, but it didn't. The Greeks got most of what was consequential in, or, or accurate in their, in their own civilization from the Egyptians, and they're very open about it. It's the modern day quackademics that don't want to understand that because very interesting book called Black Athena the Afro-Asiatic roots of Greek civilization by a, a very fine Cornell scholar called um, Martin Bernal. Um, and basically he proves that what we call history is really a, a white supremacist Eurocentric um, invention, you know, put together by the, by the ninth, mainly by the 19th and early 20th century historians because they were determined to prove that real civilization began with the Greeks because the Greeks were you know swarthy little guys but white enough they weren't Egyptian or you know, Semitic or black or anything like that or sub-saharan African like the Sphinx certainly not so so really history as it's taught even to this day is really a white supremacist con job so it really is possible that sub-saharan Africans might have built all that stuff well maybe yeah, they could be. They obviously built that face, or, or likely built that well, face. Well, it's very likely. Hey, can I take a break? Sure. My vodka? Yeah, get yourself some vodka. Okay. I wish I had some over here. Well, why don't you? I'll fly you out, fella. Okay. Anytime you want to come to, L to L.A. and do this in person, let me know. Right back. <clears throat> All right, we'll be right back with John Anthony West as John goes and uh, gets some more vodka. <laughs> Fucking love it. The computer fan. I, lo I love all of it. I love his computer fan going off is is every time he gets an email it's a beep every time you get a, a fucking text message or a message from skype that shit comes out can you yeah t can you turn that off yeah can you turn off skype try to do messaging that. whatever the hell that is but uh everybody who's listening to this thank you uh, very much for uh for being patient and then uh and if you're not familiar with this um particular subject it, it's one of my my personal favorites and john's dvd series which is called magical egypt which you can still purchase online i think it's magicalegypt.com i believe you can also get it on amazon and a bunch of different places but it is just fantastic and it's really really entertaining stuff and it has to do with so much of why egypt is so uh, such a fascinating and mysterious culture it's really uh, one of the most uh, amazing DVD series you can get. And it's it, no one but uh, it would take a guy like John who's spent his whole life being obsessed with Egypt to produce something like this. It's a real work of, uh, of passion and interest. And uh, I, I've, like I told him, I've watched it like a hundred times. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's great stuff. Is he still gone? Do we have an I'm image back. of him? Oh, I'm you're back. back. There you go. Oh, okay. Actually, All right. Uh, no, I don't think you can get it on Amazon. You can't? 
I don't think you can, but you can get it direct through me or through that website. So you can go to my website and, I think and get some, it as well. I thought someone was selling it on Amazon. Sometimes they do that, like they'll have. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think it's on Amazon. And actually, it's really it's not me. It's my. Let's say it's my work that sets it off, but it's really my genius partner, named Chance Gardner, who's responsible for that. For the, I mean, he he. He was a guy making a lot of money in L.A. as a 3D animator, and he, he got fascinated with this whole subject, sort of like you. And well, John, just, John, just he, to let you know, uh, just to yeah. let people know and let you know, because you might not know this, it is available on Amazon.com. Not oh, only is it available on Amazon.com, it's also available on Amazon Instant Video. People can hmm. watch it instantly. Is Amazon jacking you? Are they paying you for this, John? God, I don't know. It's my partner who handles the... the, the uh, it's Amazon. Who, it's... it's it's my partner who handles the business side of things, but I know, really. Well, you've been ripped you, off before, right? You told us you got ripped off for the yeah, other one. I got ripped off, but but in this case, I think I'll have to check with Chance. Check in because, on that guy. I know, it, I know that it's it, it, it's, you know, the whole thing is it just brings in no money. He's, you know, he's, he's he's sacrificed four or five years of his life putting this extraordinary thing together. And then people pirate it all the time. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, it's really criminal. Yeah, but it please, is. people, if, you've, if you want to watch thing. the Magical Egypt series, don't watch it on YouTube or watch it on any of those places where it is pirated. Please go and, uh, and support it because, uh, like I was saying, John, when you went to get your vodka, it's one of mm. my favorite all-time DVD series, and it would take a guy like you to put something like that together. It was such a work of passion. Like, n no, Very few people are going to put together eight DVDs you know, well, I that's mean, Chance who did that, really. See, I mean, he, he, he got it going, and I supplied, obviously, I supplied the Egyptology, and we conferred on how to do it, but he single-handedly produced it, shot it. I mean, it's, it's really brilliant, and, you know, it's, as I said, it's done on a shoestring, so it doesn't look like a glossy NBC production. But It's, it's beautiful. It's, it mean, doesn't... I'm, really, I'm proud to have been a part of that, but yeah. it's... You know, I mean, we're partners, but credit where credit is due. I mean, left to my own devices, I, you know, I could write, the, I could write the script, but I couldn't do the production. Yeah, it's so, it's yeah, really it's, an amazing piece of work. This is well worth getting hold of, and and actually on on the subject of putting stuff together, I've been talking, you know, on, on, on any number of occasions about us doing this the next video, the Zeptepi, the Dawn of Civilization. And, and actually, I, I should mention this because I, I have I have a <clears throat> you know nonprofit uh, foundation that we set up about ten years ago, but it's called the Ancient Wisdom Foundation. But it's been quiescent most of this time. You know, people would contribute now and again. We'd use it for travel and research and that sort of thing. But now I've got a really bright guy who contacted me, sort of a fan of the whole work and you know fascinated by the whole thing and he's really he's got the smarts and the drive to put it all together and revivify it so it's now it's now the website is under construction but we're we're now looking to both micro finance and macro finance this show and it's it's funny because it's been an idea of mine for for decades and now it's become a possibility. I mean, years ago, see, it, I haven't devoted my entire life to Egypt and these things because I started out as a novelist and, and playwright and screenwriter and had a lot of things done. And actually, I think you asked me this earlier and I, I, I wandered off from the subject, but as a, as a young kid, how did I get into this? <clears throat> I, I started out, I mean, I realized that at the age of 12 or 13 that I was living in a lunatic asylum. Everyone else called it progress, but I mean, I knew it was madness, but you know, I couldn't put it together. But by the time I was 19 or 20, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I was in a lunatic asylum, and what I wanted to be was I wanted to be the little boy who said, the emperor has no clothes. And that's when I started out writing satires, brutal satires, plays and things that were done. It's never made me money. I'm, I'm trying to resuscitate some of that stuff now. But anyway, and then gradually, 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 I understood that there was another, that human beings were not always insane. And one, one so music did it, the classical music, Beethoven's late quartets and Monteverdi's Vespers of 1610. And then when I was 
in the army in Germany, needless to say, I didn't enlist. <laughs> they drafted me. But I had a great time. I was in Germany. I had my one and only Porsche that I bought for $2,400 from the factory. 55, wow. talking about. Yeah, well, that's what it was in those days. And I remember driving as I was driving to France and early, it was in November, all by myself, um, early in the morning, and I went to the Cathedral of Chartres. It was absolutely empty. I mean, this is before there was any travel to Europe. And and I realized it was an epiphany that, you know, however monstrous the church was and is, somebody, geniuses, built this incredible structure. And then it took another few, I still didn't put it all together, it took another few years before, and by this time I had my first short story published, and I was living in Spain on the island of Ibiza. And, and gradually, gradually, I understood, you know, there was another side to this. And then all of a sudden, Again, more complicated story, but I, I got interested in the Gurdjieff work and the Ibiza would become all touristed up and I was connected with my first wife and we moved to England. She was an actress. Um, I wanted to get into the Gurdjieff work and there the first, the first non-fiction book, The Case for Astrology, showed up and that's how I got into Schroller. So that's about the late 60s when I got interested, you know, when I really, when I really got interested in all of this stuff. Anyway, anyway, the, the, um, but I always had this idea because I, I had brief, en enough experiences with, you know, with Hollywood and, um, and, you know, the film, the film industry and, and, and even theatrical side of things that, you know that the the producers own you and to get anything that's really original done the way that you want it done is next to impossible and i had this idea of somehow or another microfinancing projects but of course you couldn't do it in those days i mean how are you going to send out a billion mailings or anything like that but now with the with the internet you can get to these huge databases and so and so now we've got we're, we're putting in place a a microfinancing aspect of it and 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 actually i have i've always been good at thinking up good marketing ideas i just never do them but now well john I'm just get on twitter you need to get on twitter and then get a yes, kickstarter account yes, but, but but what we're doing and when I, um, when, when I talk about it now it's not yet a promise because we have to make sure through the lawyers that it's it's legal but we think it's legal we think we're pretty sure it can be legal but we have a a cool I came up with a really cool incentive offer, which is that if you put in, if you get, if you have a, for a $50 donation, and you can split it, you know, you 10 guys can put in five each, and one of them is going to win that. But you put in 50 bucks, and that buys you a ticket to effectively a raffle. And when, when we get up to 50,000, we get up to $50,000. We have a drawing, and somebody wins a free trip to Egypt with me. So we think that that's because I'm very interested in getting to the young people. Actually, you know, people my age. Well, most of the people my age are dead anyway. But but um, but I'm particularly interested in getting this message to young people. And you know, 50 bucks for some young people is is a lot, but it isn't really a lot if you figure it out. I mean, what's 50 bucks? It's 10 beers at a not very good bar or a meal for two at a not very good restaurant. Um, anybody can figure it out, can afford 50 bucks. So we're, we're putting this into place. And if you, if you go online, I think the website is up already. It's Ancient Wisdom. I think it's ancientwisdomfoundation.org. Now, when you go on these uh, Egyptian trips, how long do they take? Um, the standard trip is now, I think it's 15 or 16 days door to door. Whoa. And, and they're really intense. I mean, I'm, I'm talking, what's going on now goes on all day long. So it's all day you talking for 15, 16 days. Yeah. That's got to be exhausting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it must keep you uh, pretty, pretty sharp on Egyptian history. Well, it keeps me... Not only that, actually, it's that, you see, see, Egypt, nobody in America 
has ever experienced a real civilization. What we have progress, what we call progress, is the antithesis of civilization. This is shiny barbarism. And so Egypt is an eye-opener. And as I said, I came to it, you know, through art, through great sacred music, and through the Cathedral of Chartres, and then suddenly I realized how important this was, and along came Schwaller and you know, all of this study. But what Egypt does is that it introduces, and through the symbolist, the symbolist interpretation, which was what Schwaller de Lubitsch put together, otherwise it was just quackademic Egyptology, you come away angry, actually, because you've experienced this fabulous art, and you hear, listen to all this bullshit that they're telling you that has no connection with what you've actually experienced. So, so Egypt is, I, I often start lectures off by saying, Egypt is like sex. And that gets everybody's attention. Why is Egypt like sex? Well, you can read all about it, and that's kind of interesting. And you can look at pictures, and that's kind of interesting too. But until you've actually experienced it, you don't understand anything about it. So Egypt is like that. Once you're there, it hits. I mean, there's no mistaking about it. And and so it's it's to me it's very gratifying to be able to be to be the agency for allowing people to have that experience. And unfortunately, I, I originally hope to have a little business where there are you know there are a handful of people who understand symbolist Egypt well enough to, to retransmit it. But actually I'm the only one who does these trips. Well one other person, a very brilliant lady called Normandy Ellis. But even that doesn't have the intellectual rigor that mine my stuff does. So I'm almost the only show in town. But it's very satisfying to me to be able to to be able to open this experience to people and also invariably the trips have very interesting people on them with expertise in a number of of disciplines that are relevant to Egypt so no trip goes goes by without me without me learning a lot myself i mean i send sometimes very important things so it doesn't get tiring and yeah, it's a lot. Of, it's a, physically, it's a lot of work, but you know, I'm in pretty good shape for my age. So. John, I wanted to ask you a question about the more recent uh, idea that perhaps the blocks in the pyramid were not cut from stone, but rather made out of a, a limestone concrete. Have you? Are you familiar with these theories? Very. Yeah, that's Davidovitz, and shot that's been looked into by geologists. And, and it, it's completely untenable. And the video should know better. He's a polymer scientist or something of the sort. Shock has looked at this very carefully. It would be as much work to pound the stone into, into powder and then put it into molds. And you see the stones are all different sizes. So you can't do it that way. And, and w when you look at the stones, you see at the, at the blocks, they're what's called a pneumolytic limestone, which has lots of little seashells in it, looking like the shell sign, you know, like cockle shells, mm -hmm. and they're all intact. So it's it's a silly theory, and but it, on the surface, <clears throat> it it doesn't sound. On the surface, it, it sounds as though it might be convincing. It was convincing enough so that somebody, a friend of mine, put together a panel of geologists who don't have an axe to grind. It's not as though they're. It's not as though they're. Um, Egyptologists or archaeologists who have a, you know, have a stake in the thing. They go there with an open mind to look into it, and Shock certainly does. And no, it's not. They're not. And it would be just as much work to do it. And Davidovitz, Davidovitz himself says it would take a month <clears throat> to produce a limestone block and cure it well enough so that you could actually use it. So, no, it's not. So it's just it's silliness. Well, it's incorrect. It's incorrect. Some, just, yeah, some things, some things are silly. And then, see, the the alternative side of, of the argument is as irresponsible as the academic side because people get notions in their head that it's built by aliens. Well, it could be built by aliens. I can't disprove that. But, but they're as unwilling to let go of their fantasies as the academics are unwilling to let go of what are not fantasies, but... Their timeline, their incorrect timeline. 
incorrectly developed theories that, that have been, that are being and have been round, solidly disproved by people like ourselves. Now, John, there's also an issue with uh, the area underneath one of the Sphinx's paws that uh, seismic charting has uh, d d revealed mm. that there's some sort of a, um, a, a room down there, some sort Just of a... a there's, there's some sort of a cavity or chamber. We don't know. I mean, Ed Edgar Cayce, in one, of his, in one of his channeled sessions or trances, whatever he called them, uh, said that, that the, there was a chamber beneath... This one of the he, different descriptions of it, but basically underneath one of the, the paws of the Sphinx that contained the secrets of Atlantis. Now, our seismograph tells us that there is such that there is a cavity there, but and this is a question that comes up all the time. Um, and they say, why can't they excavate? Well, we're the geophysicist who did this did the work. I mean, Shock was there, but we had a guy named Tom Dobecki who was a geophysicist. Who, you know, who does the it's like an underground radiologist. You know, the, the the seismograph produces a reading that to you or me would be completely meaningless, like an X-ray was meaningless to you or me. But the radiologist can tell you a lot of, of very you know just um, precise information from an X-ray. So with a with a readout from the seismograph, and 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 the the uh, Tom DeBecky said from the from the shape of the of the readout, it looks as though it is a chamber, more or less rectangular. It's under about 15 feet of bedrock on top of it, um, and there is actually a chamber which Tom didn't even know about behind the Sphinx, a rough cut chamber. There's a block and you pull the block away and you have a little rope ladder you can go down into this rough cut chamber where there's nothing and nobody had been able to figure out who cut it or why or when but there is such a chamber there and on the on the seismograph readout the this looks the same in other words you get certain colors and stuff like that looks the same as what you get under the paw of the sphinx so the becky who you know put his neck on the line and said, "Well, this looks like cautiously, like there is a chamber there. The problem is getting in there um, because it's below what's now the water level, the water table level. So if you if you can't really excavate, or you, it would, would be an enormously difficult. To you excavate. go underwater, actually. Hmm? You go underwater. You mean as you drill, as you would dig into it, you would you actually go underwater. As you drill. But in theory, you could put down." one of those little fiber optic cameras, but if it's all water in there, you're not going to see anything anyway. To actually excavate it would mean going in there with, you know, with huge pumps pulling the water out as fast as it came in, and the Sphinx is, the Sphinx is... That would be almost impossible, <laughs> right? And the Sphinx is, it would be possible, but it would be dangerous because the Sphinx is, you know, is in pretty rough shape as it is. I mean, pieces fall off it all the time and things like that, so... It may be one of these days. Who knows if the theory takes, if the if the theory takes root, and and you know, and the the uh, you know the, the powers that be realize that it's good PR among other things to try to excavate it and see if there is anything there. Uh, meanwhile, for me, I'll stick with the geology and the other pieces of evidence. I don't I don't give an awful lot of thought. Do that, but the seismograph says there is something there. Yes. Have they detected any other undiscovered ruins or any undiscovered, uh, I mean, uh, areas that they would like to explore in Egypt, or they, do they pretty much have the entire area mapped out? Well, they have it. See, it's a complex question. They have it pretty well mapped out. Because they recently, I forget the woman's name, very interesting, the, the satellites flying over have done, I'm not sure if it's infrared or something that, 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 that gives you, I think it's infrared photography that, that tells you if there's something underground, but the photography only goes, doesn't go that deep, you know, it goes 10, 15 feet, something, I think. And it, 
and if if we're correct, if there is anything that's that's really completely buried, um, it will be deeper than that. And and so the so the photographer, the the infrared, whatever it is, I think infrared, the infrared doesn't let you know about that. But it ought to be there. I mean, see, look with the Sphinx, for example. If the head were not sticking above the ground, you wouldn't even know about it to this day. Yeah, so, that's true. Right. Yeah. You wouldn't know. It would just be sad. And why would anyone bother? But the with, with these different new technologies, certainly ground penetrating radar and seismographs will tell you if there's anything there. But they're expensive. And you know, you've got thousands of miles of desert. And you know, this is a slow process, whereas a flyover tells you a lot. So they now know that there's that there's that there are lots of buried sites, but if they're that close to the surface, the chances that they that they're going to they're going to support the the ancient you know what we call the lost civilization hypothesis is not you know not necessarily commanding, and from our for. For our purposes, it doesn't even matter because we have we have enough to go by anyway. I mean, Gobekli Tepe and probably this Easter Island stuff and the magical bracelet and certain of the other things. I mean, there are there are megalithic sites in Sardinia which are not to be believed, and nobody even knows about this. Uh, it's, a, it's a treasure trove of megalithic sites in Sardinia. It, Sardinia, yeah, they didn't just invent sardines. It's, there's this wonderful architecture there of these huge beehive-shaped stone buildings that are really amazing. So we don't need that. All we need is the all we need is the is the financing to do our um, to you know to do our our our, our, our follow-up to the mystery of the Sphinx. And ideally, what we want to do really is to get it into the theaters and then go into TV and uh, and um, you know, and the web and, and all of that stuff. Well, if you, you know, if you see if something has a, a high impact, like if you see uh, a lot of video, like viral videos that have been released online that have uh, gotten millions and millions and millions of viewers just by word of mouth, I really think that, you know, video on demand as well is, a, is another great option. Mm. Yeah, it, it is a great option. But part of the problem, of course, is, and as you must know this, I mean, do you have ads on on the show? Yeah, we do. Yeah, the the ones that Where we are they? say I mean, are they no, good? we don't. You don't see any ads. We just do them at the beginning of the broadcast. But the the flashlight ad and the on it, the uh, nootropics ad. Those those are the ones that we do. We do those, and that's it. And then we have some we have some other sponsors that we're working with in the the near future. But they're all done just by me talking. Really, I mean, because I'm blabbering on here forever and there's no ads. No, we don't have to have ads. We don't have to break any of the conversation up. That's the beautiful thing about it. We get it over with in the beginning. We mention the, the we thank the sponsors again at the end, and it allows a full two-hour intensive conversation, and especially something about ancient Egypt. I think demands that it's such a it's, it's such a complex sort of a situation to try to figure out how. The conventional wisdom is saying that when when did they believe language was invented? About fifty thousand years ago, something along those lines. They don't even know. It's just guesswork, right? It, it really is guesswork when you get back that far. The only thing that you can see that you can say as a trend is that the more they study, the further back everything goes, and not only the further back in terms of time but the further back in time in terms of sophistication. You see, I mean, actually, look, Gobekli Tepe, which is, I mean, I hope, I hope you find some photos to, or I'll send them to you to, to, to intersperse with with this talk so that people can actually see what I'm well, talking about. Well, I think about. a lot of people but, Google along but, with the show, so that's probably what a lot of people are doing right now. But, but yeah, how, go however back. However they do it, that's, oh, that's fine too. So, so I mean, with Gobekli Tepe, we're talking about 10,000 BC. Now, you know, that's five times the span of time from Jesus and Julius Caesar to us. It's pretty five crazy. Times. That's pretty if crazy back, if you wrap your head around that. Back to Chauvet. The cave of Chauvet. That's thirty thousand years. That's three times the time from Gobek from Gobekli Tepe. 
So you see, it means that we have this totally skewed vision of our of human civilization and of ourselves, basically. You know, this fucking lunatic asylum is not is not civilization. Who in their right mind would invent the bobblehead doll? <laughs> or, or, you know, or, or put on American Idol or the reality shows. This is insanity. It is insanity, but it's insanity that has achieved an incredibly high technological level of success. That's right. We, yeah, it seems right. to be a technology of a, a civilization as opposed to what Egypt was, which exactly. was, yeah. That, we don't exactly, know. That, that's what makes traveling there so interesting because they also had a technology. I mean, in certain cases, sure. we couldn't build the pyramids or maybe we could but it would it would probably be more expensive than a, than, a, than a space program and they did it evidently with ease and they did it in an era where we don't even attribute them to having metal tools they had brass exactly. they're not even copper to have any tools and you see i don't know about you but to me there's not much emotional impact from a bobblehead doll or Disneyland for that matter. And if you walk into the Egyptian temples, I mean, this happens on the trips all the time because as I said, it's like sex. You, until you've experienced that, you really don't know what it's like. You go into these temples and on my trips, now it's easy because there's practically no tourism there, but otherwise I go to a lot of trouble to figure out when to go to places so that relatively few people are there because it's important you know i mean it's like trying to listen to you know beethoven's ninth symphony in the, in the super bowl you can't do this um so if you get there and you have the place more or less to yourself the emotional impact of these things is is breathtaking and you know i mean you don't i don't know about you but you don't get that from walmart i don't no obviously not this and is the, a the garbage that goes on this I mean, is a fact lives that lives are, are obsessed with technological rubbish and violence too, of course, really stupid violence. Our setup is obviously very different than theirs, but we imagine ourselves to be the more advanced. It's just that, they don't have TVs, so we're like, oh, they were fucking idiots. You know, if they don't have the internet, we're like, well, they weren't advanced. But meanwhile, they're capable of these massive constructions. I wanted to ask you about the sarcophagus in the king's chamber. And yep. the, the evidence that it had been made with some sort of a high-speed diamond bit drill. Well, that's, that's, um, that's Chris Dunn's theory that, that we talked about, that I, I mentioned Chris Dunn before. Well, we don't know. I mean, and Chris is, see, Chris has to be, he's not a new age. My, my composer, stepson, once talked about, he's a very good composer, and he was once talking about all of the new age music and, and the, the album covers, and he said, it's all a bunch of airbrushed unicorns. And that's become a, <laughs> a kind of a metaphor for, you know, the, the far out, new agey kind of way of, of looking about things. So, but Chris is not a new agey kind of guy. <clears throat> and he, that's his field. And he, you know, he interprets it that way, except there's no, with all of the stuff that we've discovered in Egypt, there's no evidence whatsoever of having that kind of technology. Now, this, the idea of the lost civilization is the idea, the Graham Hancock's idea that, you know, there's, there's a missing era that we can't place. When, when do you believe that took place in relation to the timeline of Egypt? When was all the information or a, a good chunk of it lost and they had to start from scratch? Well, we don't know because, you see, there's enough there, not much, but scattered around so that you can say maybe it was never lost, but it, it was never manifested in, in the spectacular architecture. For example, I was talking before about the, the, the Red Pyramid of Dashur that's built over a ruinous megalithic structure, but that megalithic structure is pretty considerable. It's sort of like Newgrange and, and certain of the... Of the of the, of the megalithic structures in England and Scotland and Wales, but you know this is not nothing. And then there's this um, strange uh, stone circle, pretty ruinous, 
called Napta Playa, N-A-B-T-A-P-L-A-Y-A, in, in southwestern Egypt, uh, west of Abu Simbel, so not far from the, from the uh, Sudan border. Now this is, it doesn't look like much, but even the academics acknowledge that it's astronomically oriented and there's a lot about it that, that, that puts its date, they date it, they, academics date it to about 6000 BC. Well, astronomically oriented in 6000 BC means already that it's sophisticated. <laughs> if it's astronomy, they're not supposed to have astronomy back then. And then there's an interesting guy, a friend of mine, a physicist, and, and um, archaeoastronomer who looks at the evidence and interprets it, ter interprets it in a much more sophisticated fashion that there, there are indications there, or at least there, they are referring back to a time of about 16,000 or so BC, even though the, the stone circle itself satisfactorily dates to about 6,000 BC. And then we go to the Gobekli Tepe, and we go to the bracelet. Now we're talking 10,000 BC, and the bracelet we're talking 8,000 BC. And Chauvet, these fabulous paintings of horses and rhinoceroses and cave bears and lions, that's 31,000 BC. So how much do you need? No, they're probably living in tents. I don't know. I mean, they certainly weren't living in condos, but, but they had this knowledge and this artistry at their disposal, and they had it at a fantastically early time. So we just don't know when they lost all this stuff. We don't know when the Egyptian civilization, either whether it was a slow erosion, whether it was a, a massive decline, and somehow or another it sort of coincides with the end of the last ice age. Is that a, is that a fact as well? well? Well, yeah. Well, we think, yes, because that's when the sea levels rose 300 feet. and the, I mean, it's, it's a chaotic time then. That's when all of the mammoths and the woolly rhinoceroses and all that of that go extinct. So, and and shock actually has some very interesting has some very interesting theories about not just shock but other people about what made it go extinct and you know maybe some sort of a plasma strike like a gigantic sunspot type event. There's there's some pretty good evidence for this, but anyway, it disappears. I mean, the, the Sphinx is the Sphinx. And Gobekli Tepe may be after that, but if the Sphinx is earlier, one of the one of the, the um, objections we always had to face: Well, how could the Sphinx be the evidence of this amazing earlier civilization, and there's nothing else? Well, there is something else. There's lots of other stuff with water weathering and things of that nature in Egypt, but not not much of it spectacular. Gobekli Tepe, Tepe, that's spectacular. So. We don't know. Are there hieroglyphs that detail any of the construction methods that were used? A little bit. Um, there's there's one there's one wall relief in nothing to do with pyramids. No, absolutely nothing, and nothing to do with the Sphinx. I mean, the Egyptians. What about obelisks? The obelisks. Because no, that's pretty well, spectacular, yes no. too. That's something a lot of people aren't even aware of, how spectacular those are. Well, they're plenty spectacular. There's one relief in the Temple of Edfu, which is a very late Ptolemaic temple of between 250 B.C., you know, into Roman times, built in stages, that shows the pharaoh with a rope around an obelisk, sort of pulling it, up into position by himself. Well, that's not meant to be taken literally, unless it's a very small obelisk. But in Egypt, what you see is what you get. So when you see evidence that you don't necessarily like, but it's there in the, you know, it's, in the, in the it's there in the temple walls. Well, you can't really ignore it just because you want to believe that the aliens built everything. <laughs> so. <laughs> so there's the pharaoh pulling the obelisk up, and there's a theory developed, it's the one favored by the Egyptologists at the moment, I mean, even they can't be wrong all the time, and uh, by a, a, an Egyptologist named uh, Labib Habashi, um, which talks about how they take these obelisks, which weigh hundreds of tons, they somehow get them out of the quarry. This is really, 
in words it doesn't make any sense. When we're in Egypt and you're at what's called what's called the unfinished obelisk in Aswan, and here's this block of stone that they were pulling out of the rock and they didn't make it for re interesting reasons that developed the fault line. But had they got this block of stone out of the bedrock, it would have weighed 1,200 tons. That's, that's a big stone. And somehow that they got it out of the quarry and onto rafts or boats, probably in the flood season, and drifted it down the Nile, maybe to Luxor, who knows? We don't know where it was intended to go. And then they would have somehow or another had to get it up into position. And according to Labi Bhavashi, they did this by pulling it up a gigantic ramp and it was set up in such a way that with a with a kind of a you know, the, it, up the ramp, it would come up the ramp with the with its bottom at the top part and then gradually with lots of people with ropes and you could be surprised I mean, how, how how precise you can be with lots of trained men with ropes and they would gradually pull it up and and it would go there was a kind of a deep shaft that was constructed that was full of sand and they gradually pull the sand out from under and all of these guys pulling with the ropes would gradually lever it up into position and then very exactly place it down on its base. But how they get the sand out the last minute? When you're there, all of this makes sense. But it's, it's fascinating to try to figure out if this is how it's done. We don't know. But all we can say is that they did it. And it's pretty damn amazing. Well, one of the things I thought was really yeah. fascinating was when they had to move uh, some gigantic statues. They had to cut them up and then replace them in a new area. They uh, they had to like cut giant statues in half. I mean, talk about that in incredible project and what you thought about that, just no, from that, an archaeological that's, standpoint. That's, that's that's Abu Simbel, and it wasn't that they were statues. They were. This is a temple cut into the rock face, and the the four statues of Ramses the second were sculpted into the rock face itself. In other words, they were integral. They were not freestanding statues. So when they built the Aswan Dam and they would have flooded this fabulous place, um, they got together a whole bunch of money, $90 million, I think it was. Um, UNESCO got it together and they got all of the engineers. And what they had to do is they had to, basically they had to move a hole. So they had to cut around the temple and then they had to cut because the statue is enormous, 60, 65 feet high. And then they had to cut them into four and move the blocks because they moved the entire, they moved the hole up to the top of the hill where, where that, they were, that they were built into because the water would have covered where they were. So that's, that's Abu Simbel. And so, yeah, they had to cut but they weren't freestanding statues, but still it was a modern, you know, it was a pretty considerable modern engineering feat. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, the example is the statue of the colossal figure of, of Ramses. That's the basis of Shelley's famous poem, Ozymandias. You know, I met a traveler from an antique land, blah, blah, blah. And this is a statue that weighs, it's ruined. It, it, it exploded in an earthquake somewhere around Julius Caesar taught, but but um, this this originally weighed about a thousand tons, and they got it down the river somehow, and that's amazing enough. But then, how they get it off the boat? In other words, assuming that they're moving it in flood season on giant rafts, then they've got to get the rafts. They've got to get this thousand ton block off the raft and move it into place. Well, the actual moving it on the flat, there are, when you're talking about before, what evidence is there? There's one, I forget what tomb it's from, but there's a tomb relief showing a huge sledge with a giant colossal uh, statue of the Pharaoh on it. And then lots and lots of men pulling the sledge over the, over the land and somebody in the front pouring something, maybe some water, because slick mud actually, 
is remarkably slippery and you can pull things. So, as I said earlier, what, what you see is what you get. You can't deny that evidence when you see the evidence in front of your nose and say, oh, well, it's aliens dropping things from <laughs> space age helicopters or something of the sort. But when the evidence is there, that's the evidence. But you've got to be careful about the evidence. So there are scenes, symbols that look like a helicopter in the Temple of Abydos, but are not a helicopter. This is a complicated subject. As yeah, you yeah, in incredibly complicated subject. Now, no, no subject of uh, ancient civilizations would be complete without a discussion of uh, ancient Sumer and uh, the the fantastical work of Zechariah Sitchin. I'm sure you're familiar with all that stuff. What's what's your your take on Zechariah Sitchin's ideas that you know the Anunnaki came from another planet? For a lot of people who don't know, it's some pretty crazy stuff. That states yes. that human beings were created through genetic engineering and yeah well I, I think actually I'm, I'm not a Sitchin any and and I find when when, when Sitchin I, I mean I, I can't challenge his translations from the from the Sumerian because um, I just can't but they're his translations and unfortunately to the best of my knowledge I don't know of any of the you know Sumerian experts who bothered to take a look at his work, which is too bad. I mean, it's irresponsible. But I do know that when he's talking about Egypt, he's totally off the wall, totally. And from that, I extrapolate and do not much care for his work. And when he gets into explaining who the gods were, um, that they're they're alien. They're, they're aliens as malignant as ourselves who enslaved the, that a primitive human race. Created us the, even. The, and that the gods of Egypt and everywhere else are really just aliens that have been misunderstood by primitive imaginations. This is really stupid and malignant <laughs> bullshit. Um, and, and, and here's a bit of evidence that one of the Egyptian creation myths concerns the, the god before there were any gods, the god called Atum, um, who exists before there is existence, as it were. And he creates existence through an act of masturbation. And he creates the first polar, the po first polarization, the first female and the first male. It's rather biblical, this. Well, now, if this is an ancient alien, and this is a Sitchin-esque Sitchin interpretation. What is it that the primitives saw an ancient alien whacking off behind a tree <laughs> and decided that this was how the universe was created? It has absolutely nothing to do with this. In other words, the gods of Egypt and the gods of all other civilizations, including those we sometimes think are primitive, represent cosmic principles. They are not people. They are not aliens, they are principles and they are scientific. The scientists don't like this either. But, but when, you, when you look at Egyptian mythology and try, to, and try to historicize it, as it were, you find that, that, you, that, that you're in a, you know, you're in a, this is a ludicrous exercise. And as far as I'm concerned, the whole notion that we human beings, the creators, not Sitchin, but some others did create the Cathedral of Shatka and the builders, the temples of Egypt and so on, are somehow or another deluded, deluded primitives who were, who were enslaved by, by aliens and who then found a way to set themselves free but remembered their alien backgrounds and commemorated them in all of this wonderful architecture. This is really stupid. And it, not only is it stupid, it's, it's malignant. It's malignant in the same way. It's the opposite of, let's say, of Darwinian evolution, which, you know, in other words, of, of it, 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 it deprives human existence of all meaning. And that's, in fact, what modern science does, modern rationalist science. 
deprives us of any meaning in life and in fact they're very proud of it you should read some of the stuff do you do you contemplate how we were created or how we burst out from the lower hominids how there's all these other primates know, running around not sure that we did not sure there's that we did the lower hominid. no i think there's, there's no evidence for that there are lower there are hominids and then there's us and the further back you go there we are so this we is, just this is again this is a, a sitchin-esque stuff except it's called science that we have to have had that we have to have had more and more primitive beings that were responsible you know that gradually became us stopped being apes and became people and what do you think happened we are doing Chauvet and Gobekli Tepe and the Sphinx and so on I don't buy that for two seconds actually actually shock and I high up on our list um, in fact one of the reasons I got a I got on with Jacques. That's more. <laughs> he needed a lot of time. Um, funny story that how I got hold of Jacques because I developed the I developed the Sphinx theory all on my own. I'm not a geologist and spent you know months in the in the libraries working out the geology and convinced myself to put together the whole theory of the water weathering, and then it just sat there for ten years. Uh, Serpent in the Sky was published in whenever it was when. 79, something like that, and um, nobody paid any attention to it. And then I had a friend who had been teaching English at Cairo, you know, American University in Cairo, and he was very interested. He got a hold of my work, he was very interested. And one day we were having, and he taught at Boston University, and one day we were having a dinner, and he said, You know, this symbolist Egypt stuff of yours is, I think, really important. You know, is, and I said, Yeah, I think it is too. And he said, well, how do we, how do we, what can I do as an academic to, you know, to help you? And I said, instantly, I said, find a geologist to look into the, to the water weathering of the Sphinx. And I laughed. I, was, I mean, I said, I knew from lots of experience that finding an open-minded scientist was like finding a fundamentalist Christian who loves his enemies. And... And he said, well, wait a minute, there's a young guy teaching with me. Anyway, one thing or another led to, to Robert Schock. And gradually, gradually, at first he didn't, he was interested in the evidence, he didn't, but he didn't want to even, I wasn't even supposed to know his name. And finally, because he was up for tenure, and if anybody thinks you're looking for a lost civilization, and up, you're up for tenure, you're not going to get your tenure. Anyway, eventually, Schock and I met. And as I said, I've been, I, 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 I find, not evolution. Evolution is a fact, but Darwinian evolution by natural selection is arguably the, the, the greatest superstition ever foisted upon the human race. What do you well, believe happened? What, how do you believe that human beings came to be? I don't know, but I don't know how mosquitoes came to be either. And, uh, and, the, and the Darwinian explanation is, so-called explanation, is completely untenable. But what's what's untenable is that human beings would evolve through nat or progress through natural selection. That's untenable. Uh, that's 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 part of the key. See, when we Shock and I, let me let me go backtrack. There. When okay. I met up with Shock, and so it was, you know, it was very a, a cautious meeting. I mean, he there he was, you know, involved with this loony heretic me, and we were getting on pretty well and having a discussion. And I gave a lecture, he organized a lecture for me at Boston University to the faculty and interested students, and that, that went quite well. This is what we're talking now, 89. And then I went back to Shock's house for, for dinner, and, and uh, the subject of evolution came up. And he's not just a geologist and geophysicist, but a paleontologist as well. So he's very into you know, the whole evolutionary hypothesis. And I mentioned, do you know who... Uh, Stephen Jay Gould was. No, I do not. Well, well he, he died not too long ago, but he was everybody's favorite. Um, he was everybody's favorite. I'm not sure if he was a geologist or biologist. He was sort of like the equivalent of Carl Sagan. You know who he was, right? Mm -hmm, sure. Yeah. Well, he was sort of the Carl Sagan of geology and evolutionary biology. And he was in the New Yorker all the time and all of that sort of stuff. And I said to Chuck, you know, well, what do you, you know, we got into carefully into the whole question of, of evolution and um, and I said well what do you think of Stephen Jay Gould and he said oh he's a bozo and I instantly knew that I had somebody I could talk to 
who realized that this guy was indeed literate, but a bozo. And actually, just without getting deep into this, because this is, this is our next book, after we write The Bridge of Syrah, Chuck is really into this, is that I hope the definitive anti-Darwin book, not anti-evolution, anti-Darwin. And let me just give you the, the little clue. You use the language yourself, everybody does. Natural selection. A lot of, this is not science. This is the, the, the equivalent of George Orwell's newspeak. It's science speak. If you look at the two words themselves, natural selection is, is, is promoted as the means whereby things automatically, by a series, this is a quote from a very famous current evolution of Darwinian, um, Daniel Dennett, a series of lucky coincidences produces mosquitoes and us and all the rest of it. And this is supposed to be, the agency for this is natural selection. But if you look at the word natural, if you go to the dictionary, even the great big Oxford English dictionary that I have, and look up the word natural, nowhere does natural mean accidental or fortuitous. Natural simply means of the natural world. So to say that it's natural means that it's accidental has nothing to do. The word natural doesn't describe accidental. Has no n Nowhere does it connote or suggest fortuitousness. And then you look at selection. This is also selection. Selection presupposes choice and purpose. The roulette wheel does not select the, the, the number that the ball is going to fall on. People are selected for the NBA draft. Candidates are selected for running for office. It suggests choice. Natural suggests hierarchical order of the most sophisticated purpose. So to call an accidental process natural selection is a con job. If they want to describe it, actually, actually Daniel Dennett does a very good job. He says, evolution is nothing but a series of lucky coincidences. If they call the whole theory, the theory of lucky coincidences, it would stop sounding scientific. We don't know how any of these things developed and the the much derided uh, what do they call themselves the intelligent design people also they use the wrong a, a bit they use the wrong language because intelligent design suggests a designer and then you're talking about god and of course they're not be, they're not going to be talking about god and getting away with it in in academic circles but in fact, if they called it intelligent creativity, they'd be closer to the mark. Creativity is built into the universal structure. It's, it's creativity itself, but we're in the middle of creativity um, ourselves. So it's very difficult to discuss this, particularly because we've been brought up in, in, this, in, in, in this paradigm of, of science speak. And actually, after the Bridge of Siran, Shock is as much into this as I am, and he's you know he's got all the credentials behind him. We're going to do a book, I think, called if I if I have my way, Darwin, Darwin, is that what's the title? D D D D D D. Darwin debunked, Darwin declawed, Darwin dethroned. A scientist and a scholar deconstruct the cargo cult of the West. It's a fraud from beginning to end. It is not science. Evolution is a process. This is, this is demonstrable. The manner in which it manifests through supposed natural selection is a total fraud. So what total. you're saying, just to clarify, is that evolution is real, but the process of natural selection due to random mutations is exactly. something you don't buy. You think there's, there's more of a design element to it all. It, more, it seems to be acting and, cr and responding in a creative and intelligent way. That's right. In other words, it is creativity. Creativity is there before anything is created. In other words, it's, it's, it's the matrix in which things somehow or another, and we don't know the process, evolve, but it's, it's not, it's not, it, it probably is not random. And in fact, there, there's, you know, there's a ton of stuff when you get into this. I have a folder this wide on 
on um, you know on evolution that Chuck and I will that Chuck and I will get into one of the days, and I hope pretty soon somewhere along the line that it can't it can't work that way and the the deeper they look the more they find I mean I just had today actually you should you should write Hancock and get this guy his his, his guy who works with him Steve Detweiler list that he sends out every week of interesting articles. There was, there was one just today, or maybe it was one of the other science things that I get all the time about the intelligence, the intelligence of plants. They actually communicate with each other and so on. In other words, we exist within a creative matrix. It's not that stuff just happens and all of a sudden there's intelligence. It's that there is intelligence and we are the result of the intelligence. Not that God woke up one morning and said, well, today I think I will create mosquitoes. It's that somehow that it's like imagining, for example, do you suppose that the cells in our body have any idea of, or my body have any idea that I'm here, I am talking to a guy called Joe Rogan for three hours about these subjects? They don't know. I don't think they know anyway. Something knows. That they know. So, so that's something like us. We're cells in a in a much in a in a prodigious but intelligent and directed organism. And that's the that's actually the even though you'd never know it from listening to the baloney that the you know that the priests and the mullahs and all of the rabbis and all of these imbeciles talk about. This is actually what's at the basis of all of the religions, however corrupt they've become. We, we have a function to perform in the whole gigantic structure and it's, it's hierarchical and it's organized. And it's up to us to, you know, to do our bit to do it. But natural selection is, 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 as I said, it's a linguistic fraud, it's spin. So this is where it gets really crazy, okay? Because uh, where did the, hu how did the human animal emerge? If the human animal didn't emerge from lower hominids and we, we existed in this form from the beginning, is that the supposition? Because they've uh, absolutely no. proven it's that there have been lo lower forms of, of human beings, other, other different branches of the human tree that, that died off. Neanderthal, for example, Australopithecus, there's a, a bunch of different ones from the past they suppose were what they call quote-unquote early man. You don't buy that? Yeah, that's early. We don't know where they lived within themselves, you see, as, as I was saying earlier. They're assuming that these are primitive beings. When I talked earlier, I mean, we're going with our Sphinx and our Gobekli Tepe and our Chauvet. Mm -hmm. You think that the primitive pe people who produced Chauvet? And as I said earlier, really, our, our, our level of development is an inner thing. You can't tell. And as I, as I said earlier, using the image of, of dance as, an, as a, a let's say, an enlightened society that expressed itself only in dance and by dancing experienced, you know, the, the highest levels of creativity. See, this is the thing that most of these scientists are, are seriously defective human beings. They're uncreative by nature and they distrust their own emotions. You want to know about creativity? You listen to the Beethoven quartets or walk into the Cathedral of Shanta or the temples of Egypt, and that, that, that tells you a lot, even if you can't necessarily explain it. I mean, we, however we are, it may be, let's say, the theosophists and certain of the, of the esoteric societies, you know, have it that we're there from the beginning, but we're only made manifest, however that happens, at a later date. There's absolutely no evidence that, you know, they come up with Lucy or something like that. We don't know. We have no idea what went on inside Lucy's head and heart. None. But he's we do people, know that 65 million... People. Sorry, he's we do know that... These are defective people extrapolating, rationalizing. Basically what they're doing is they're rationalizing their own emptiness. We know that 65 million years ago there was a mass extinction. There was no flowering plants before that. There was a completely different sort of an atmosphere, completely different animals here. 
What, how, yeah. what happened there? I mean, is that obviously if most life was wiped out and the current life that we have right now exists post 65 million years ago. Well, yeah, but I mean, if you, if you follow this stuff, which I do, um, you know, every week there's a new theory about what happened 65 million years ago. We don't know. And we, in fact, we don't even know if there were people then. There's, you know, there's, a, there's some pretty interesting evidence that say that Tell that dog to settle down. Longer. What? I said, tell that dog to settle down or I'm going to go tell him. Come here, Sabu. Come here. <laughs> Sabu. Hey, let me What's, right. What kind of dog is it? Sabu, come here. Sabu. <laughs> this dude's awesome. <laughs> he just goes and gets his dog. We should probably wrap this up too. Yeah. But I want to ask him about uh, how, many, how, many, how many minutes are we in? About 2.45. I want to ask him about the stone ape theory Hello. before we take off. Hey, there he is. Hello. What's up, buddy? Is that a bully dog? No, that, Can't is, see his that face. is an ancient Egyptian greyhound. An ancient it's Egyptian it. greyhound. Oh, wow. It's You're it's Egyptian it's to the bone, son. Look at you. Well, it was the dogs that got me interested in Egypt to begin with. When, I, when my first short story was published in 57, I went to the island of Ibiza in the, in, the, in, the, in the Mediterranean, and these dogs stayed pure there. And I've ah. had them ever since. It's, you know, it's, um, I wanted to... They got me interested in Egypt to begin with. I wanted to ask you one more question about the development of human beings. Are you familiar with the work of Terence McKenna? Yes. Were you familiar with his stoned ape theory? Yeah, I don't go for it. You actually. don't go for it. Um, no, I have... Actually, his theory for the folks at home is the doubling of the human brain size occurred over a period of two million years, which he coincides with the rainforest receding into grasslands and then the lower hominids coming out of the trees, experimenting with new food sources and eating psilocybin mushrooms. That's, that's, that's actually it's funny because for somebody who did a lot, of, a lot of experimenting with ayahuasca, which I've also done actually, um, he's... He's extrapolating and trying to make his experience fit in with Darwinian theory, and he should know better than that because he was a very smart guy. So you're you're but feeling. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm 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 more inclined to think. You know, listen. The virtually all of the ancient texts talk about a kind of Eden-like state. You know, an enlightened state that we've descended from. In other words, we start at the top and and degenerate. And to me this is not this is this is, is is not so difficult to imagine. I mean this it happens often that things a great teacher comes along and everything disappears. You know, we tend to think that everything's like technology and you start off, you know, with the eighteen ninety two Mercedes and suddenly we've got a you know, with a two thousand and twelve Ferrari. But with Egypt, for example, it seems to be at its height at the very beginning, with no period of development. We don't know. So it's just a, it's such a massive mystery, and your all your years of exploring it have literally got you to the point where you're like, no one knows, and any talking about it is just nonsense. Well, and anyway, talking about it as though you know. In definitive terms, yeah, in definitive terms. No. It's just yeah, so we, crazy. We just we just plain don't know. And, but one of the things you can depend upon, actually, is that who are you going to take your lessons from? The guys who invented the bobblehead doll and the, and, the, and the atom bomb or the guys who did Chartres and the Temple of Luxor and the, and the, and the, and the, and the late quartets? Me, I'll go with the creatives any day because I am one myself. Not that, I'm, did a, not that I've done a late quartet. How long was a period between the decline of the old kingdom and the time where they discovered the pyramids, which were, there was no one living in them when they were discovered. When, when, when uh, Napoleon's army marched through Egypt, there was no one living in the, in the, the, the pyramids. Like they, and that's well, where nobody, we lost a lot of information. Nobody in the pyramids ever. They're, I mean, they're... As far as anyone knows, they're right. very difficult to live in. I, I'm sorry, I meant that area. The, there was no one. They weren't. They didn't inhabit that area. Oh yeah, sure they did. I mean, it was all farmland around there. They're they're in the desert, but just you know, a couple of a few hundred yards below where the Sphinx is is all the valley. So yeah, so it's all farmland and everything. So, oh, my, yeah, there. so the, my point was like, what time did it all fall apart? Where it was essentially the sphinx and the pyramids and all that were stopped being used for what they were, were abandoned and then people had to come back to them and go wow look at what we have oh, well, here yeah that, that you can put sort of put a date to i mean the egyptian religion died 
uh, shortly after the you know, first, second century AD. It was no longer being practiced, although the, the knowledge percolated down into Alexandria and, you know, dispersed around the Middle East, the library of Alexandria, you know, this was, this was a hotbed of, 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 of intellectual and philosophical activity, always. I mean, Alexandria was always there, but the actual Egyptian religion as such died somewhere, let's say, in the middle of the third century AD. But as I said earlier, then the hermetic disciplines in alchemy and astrology and magic and number symbolism and Neoplatonism, all of that knowledge continued throughout, you know, throughout European civilization. I mean, the, this, the, the Renaissance, the, the great figures of the Renaissance were always credited with, the, the, with opening the way out of superstition and so on, you know, and into modern science. They did open the way to modern science, but they themselves believed that their own knowledge, when Kepler discovered the laws of planetary motion, he said, ah, I've discovered the, I've rediscovered the secrets of the Egyptians. It was a given to them that, that all of this, that this advanced knowledge was available in Egypt, but it was Schroller who actually, this is one of his great, 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 great contributions to human thought. It was Schroller who proved that they had it. No mistaking it. And I'm they had it, there. and it came Sorry. out of nowhere. Hmm? And they had it, and it came out of nowhere. And there was nothing before it, and then all of a sudden, this incredibly intelligent know. civilization. As I said, Joe, you don't know don't what know. was there before. It's just too crazy. You keep going back, and they keep going back, and the further they go back, all of a sudden they come across something that disproves everything they thought before. Look, Chauvet. This is wonderful. This is spectacular art in the cave. How were those people living? Well, they didn't have television sets, bobblehead dolls. But if you can paint like that, you, you, you've got something serious going on inside you. And who says they invented it? You see, the further back you go, the more tenuous everything gets. Recently, there have been some interesting studies on flint napping. On you know, in other words, cutting flint to make to make different kinds of tools. Well, this is this is actually a pretty advanced art, and they're finding flint tools, very sophisticated flint tools, that go back two hundred thousand years. Well, what was going through their heads that they're doing this stuff? We don't know. What was going through their hearts? They've discovered this is again only the last couple of years that sea travel was going on between. North Africa, and I'm not sure if it was Cyprus or some of the Greek islands, it's either 100,000 years ago or 200,000 years ago. So if you follow this stuff, the, 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 more, the more that's discovered, the more you become impressed that, that some kind of advanced knowledge was always there, and even that is, is based upon a technological, this is the only way we tend to think, a technological assessment of what they know we don't know what was going on inside them so we don't know how intelligent they were and that the possibility is that they were right fr this intelligent from the beginning maybe and, and and it isn't even a question of intelligence it's it's more a question really of, ex of of experience i mean how much intelligence do you need to let's say to be moved by a beethoven quartet so you don't think about this stuff it's just we're brought up in such a way by, the, by this iniquitous church of progress of ours to think that you have to be able to do complex mathematics and you know all kinds of stuff in order to be civilized and then even even when even when you have that point of view the further back you go you see that they had a cosmology and you see that they had a geometry and they had technology to produce a gobekli tepe and a, a, a chauvet so so the whole so the whole Darwinian paradigm has exploded when you take all of those things into consideration. Is it possible that it, the Dar Darwinian model works if you just take the timeline way back and then people evolved over hundreds of thousands of years and hundreds well, of thousands of years earlier than we thought? Well, that, that's what they say. But why should it? In other words, in other words what, is there in the, what is there in the nature of the hydrogen atom that presupposes that that things are going to get more complicated and sophisticated. Who says? 
Well, we say by our own designs on Earth, our own physical, you know, our creations. Why should that be accidental? Maybe, why should there not be, why should there not be, let's say, a, a plan to it, just as, for example, just as we grow from a fertilized ovum and we go through this complex process of gestation and then we're born and then it's up to us what we're going to do with our lives and so on. Who says that's an accident? Yeah, yeah, and who what, says what, that we're not acting? How, I mean, to begin with, how do you prove an accident? See, these assholes who have no creativity in them are determined to make the world sound as meaningless as they experience it. As bland and passionless and as, as divine. Exactly. Magic. This is deliberate because they don't know any better and in fact they hate creative people for the most part well that's one of the beautiful things about your the the the, the title of your dvd magical egypt okay, well, that's what it, is. it really it's is that's right. it really is and and thank you very much for coming on the show today man you have explained a, a lot of things in in some imp incredible detail <laughs> it's been an honor to get to ask you questions because uh, i have been a huge fan of your work for many many years now and i'm a huge fan of that DVD series, and I would love to go eventually to Egypt with you someday. We should do that. We should figure something out. It doesn't have to be that eventual. All you have to do is talk about it and get 10 people from your very, very extensive store of people to go and even get a free trip. I could do that. We can make that happen. We're going to do it. I'd like, All right. I'd like to say one thing because I have a list of things that I want to talk about. Okay. And one, of them, one of them is I don't know, you know, do you know who Gerald Salente is? No. He's a trends analyst, and he's a very, very interesting guy. He's a colleague. Much I've heard of his name before. Much of my these days is, is working with him. He's, I'm co-writer and executive editor of the Trends Journal. And it's, it, it, I mean, he's, he, he, he forecasts trends, and he's probably been more accurate over the last 30 years than anyone else. And we put out, he puts out, we put out, he puts out, really, um, something called the Trends Journal. And it's very interesting because... What he sees coming up is not pretty, um, and he's right a, a lot of the time. And I mean, I try, I try to tell people that they really, because I'm talking the esotericism and the ancient Egypt and the you know the meaning of the real civilization, and Gerald is, Gerald is, but between us, and we've got really some very high-level people working with us, a brilliant illustrator, and. We put out this journal that, boy, we, I mean, this thing is coming unstuck in a hurry. And, and if people don't individually and collectively prepare for it, they're going to be unprepared. And so we put out the, the, the Trends Journal, I think it's... Um, Are you talking about a collapse in the economy, the end of civilizations, that kind of thing? Yeah, well, the end of civilization as we know it, very likely. Yeah, unless, unless enough people act together quickly and they probably won't so I mean, in other words buy gold <laughs> buy sure, gold make sure you've got a getaway plan and who and is, where, is coming up. What? where can people get this newsletter uh, it's, it's, a, it's a journal uh, look up um, go to trends journal or google up Gerald Salente C-E-L-E-N-T-E -E. he's a very interesting guy he's a real he's a real um, flame-throwing it that excitable Italian he's on Alex Jones all the time but the journal the journal is, is a, a really interesting publication and I'm very I'm very proud to be a big part of it so right. look it up for yourself we'll check it out and your website is <laughs> jawest.com and uh, yeah, you don't have a Twitter yet website. and there you find out about the trips and all kinds of other stuff and you don't have a Twitter yet no, I'm on Facebook, but I never do anything. My <laughs> daughter is looking after it for me. Tell your daughter no, to get you a Twitter. We need a John Anthony West Twitter. We'll populate that very quickly, and people yeah, can well, find out about your trips. My daughter will do that because she's because as I said, we're, re, we're we're reviving, we're reincarnating our our ancient wisdom foundation, and and by the way, oh, I should put a plug in that before we put up because it's. I told you. I mean, we're pretty sure. I can't be a promise yet that we've got this incentive thing going. And if you pull up ancientwisdomfoundation.org, there'll be some information about the projects that we're involved in. And, and I really do believe that, that unless, unless enough of us, of humanity, 
goes back to or recreates a civilization based upon the ancient principles. In other words, we're not going to rebuild pyramids again or mummify our pharaohs or anything like that. But the principles, I mean, Egypt is a one-issue civilization. It's, it's based upon the quest for immortality, about the, the notion of the immortality of the soul, which I absolutely believe in. Um, and without that, no civilization is possible. So, so the, and, and the principles upon which Egypt and the other ancient civilizations are, are founded is the principles are eternal. I mean, the, the civilization is past. When, as I said, we're not going to mummify our pharaohs again. But without that understanding, and, and without an understanding of where we're heading at the moment, there's plenty of scare stuff out there. A lot of it is valid, but most of the scare stuff doesn't have the, the antidote built into it. And I like to think that, that we do. I think, like to think that this conversation we've just had is one of, not of despair, but of the possibility of renaissance. And boy, and it's something, you know, it's, let's say a spiritual doctrine is not something you believe in. The belief is useless. It's just credulity. It's something you do. You have to do it. Well, John, I think also there's just the, the ability to spread that kind of information and knowledge to people and to be able to do it in a form like this, it's very rare and very new. And I think that the Internet and this open access to information that we have on it is one of the best hopes that we have for turning this whole thing around. And yep. thank you very much, my friend. Thank you very much for doing this. I would like to do it any other time with you. We'll, we'll eventually have to work some kind of a cruise thing out, and we'll, we'll all go down to Egypt and, and get our minds blown with you. Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate it. Take care, John. Take, Take care, care, brother. My pleasure. Bye. That. Are we done? That for me, man. That is. Tell me when we're off Skype. Okay. Okay. That for me, man. That was amazing. Holy shit, that guy's awesome. That was, um, you know, I mean, there you need a guy who's out there doing something like that to get that kind of information out, and just I'm just so happy that he exists. Check out his Magical Egypt DVD series. It'll fucking blow you away. Thank you to The Fleshlight for sponsoring our podcast. Go to JoeRogan.net, click on the link for The Fleshlight, enter in the code name Rogan, and save yourself 15% off the number one sex toy for men. Thank you to Alpha Brain for um, all your cognitive enhancing function needs go to on it.com that's o-n-n-i-t we have shroom tech sport shroom tech immune alpha brain and new mood a 5 htp and l tryptophan mood enhancing serotonin boosting supplement it's all good stuff it's all 100 percent money back guarantee for the first order first order of 30 pills try it if you don't believe in it if you don't like it you don't want any more say it sucks get your money back this is how concerned we are with making sure that people do not feel ripped off but instead we provide you with something that i 100 percent believe in i 100 percent take and we stand behind it we don't want anybody getting ripped off it's the shit I, I take it every day i take it before every podcast i take it for every comedy show i take it before joe jetto that's it for this week of the joe rogan experience podcast but if you're fucking podcast starving you're like dude i ain't heard you talk enough we are going to be back Brian as well uh, on the Ice House Chronicles tonight. Um, Feb. What is it? June? The fuck are we? June eighth, um, Friday night. Um, if you want to listen to it on iTunes or any other place, go to desquad.tv. It's the Ice House Chronicles, and you can subscribe to it on iTunes and get that shit. It's all, of course, for free, like all the shit we give you guys. Okay.